To call to order the regular meeting of the Solving City Council, January 27th, 6.30 p.m. Could I get a roll call? Thank you, Mayor. Member Tim Clark? Here. Councilmember Dionitz? Here. Councilmember Johnson? Here. Councilmember Waite? Here. Mayor Chusong? Here. Uh, all present, Mayor, who have quorum. Thank you. Robert, you mind releasing the pledge? Yes, please. Everybody stand. Place your right hand over your heart. Repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the first item we have on the agenda tonight is public communications, written or verbal. We have a uh, presentation by the Open Streets Initiative. clicking myself here that sounds complex <laughs> that's why I'm retiring too much tech good evening mr. mayor and council members thank you for inviting our open streets committee heal coalition to make this brief presentation this evening uh, getting right to it we're specifically asking the city of Solvang to now join with SB CAG traffic solutions and the city of Buellton uh, in helping to sponsor an open streets event, which this year will be in Buellton, uh, planned for Solvang in 2021, and then in the one of the valley townships, either um, Los Olivos or San Inez in the future year, we would rotate. Uh, we wanna make this a sustainable event, so that's why we're looking at having in all three uh, communities, giving them each a chance to host. So, the Heal Coalition uh, formed about three years ago. We, after a couple of years, we came to the city of Solvang to ask the city to pass a resolution uh, to become a recognized Heal city in the state of California, which you did. And part of that uh, coalition that uh, came together, we came together because of the um, problem of o overweight and obesity, not only in the state of California, but uh, right here in Santa Barbara County. Uh, I look today uh, at public health statistics and one out of five uh, school-age students is obese, not just overweight, but actually obese, which is a higher uh, weight classification. More than uh, half of the adults in the state of California are either overweight or obese. This costs the state of California nearly $50 billion a year in uh, health, extra health care costs and also in uh, lost productivity. So a group of uh, leaders in the community from People Helping People, YMCA, Solvang Chamber, Cottage Hospital, the Bike Coalition, um, the Third District Supervisor's Office, the cities of Buellton and Solvang, and I might point out that your representative position is currently uh, not filled. Uh, parents, Inclusion San Inez Valley, Valley Wellness Collective are all part of this coalition. And we've chose as a major thrust, we had a series of objectives about how we can improve uh, food, healthy food and uh, physical activities in the San Inez Valley and came upon this project called uh, Open Streets Initiatives. 
and to just very quickly go through that. Uh, Open Streets is about introducing residents to biking and walking, bike radios for children so that there's bike safety and bike education, promoting local physical fitness and wellness programs and activities and wellness programs within uh, businesses like the City of Solvang, like People Helping People. We have a wellness program that we operate. Our managers take a month and provide a wellness activities uh, activity every month. Uh, it's a way of showcasing uh, local businesses, especially the businesses that are along uh, the byway that's used for the open street, which is closed to traffic for that day. That's why it's called an open street. And it supports greater civic engagement and community building. So how does this work? Probably this way. Ooh, ooh, I learned something tonight. Thank you. Well, oh, the arrow points in the right direction. Even I could figure that out. So what makes open streets different than other uh, street festivals or events? In this case, not all activities will be free. The majority of activities will be free. There may be some uh, small fees for, you know, making a succulent garden, uh, making some sort of tooled leather work, something like that. But for the most part, the activities will be free. The road uh, route is open and long enough to promote biking, rollerblading, skateboarding, jogging through the route. There'll be special activities sort of races with three-wheel bikes for kids, those kinds of things. Features more activities versus uh, passive information booths. There'll be some wellness booths, Cottage Hospital will participate, the uh, Chumash Clinic, et cetera, but more activity-oriented, getting people involved in dance or folkloric, et cetera. Um, and the idea of repeating the event uh, year after year so it's not just a one-shot uh, one deal. So this is not a, a new idea. Not e it started in South America, but it's not even a new idea in Santa Barbara County. You can see Santa Barbara, Guadalupe, Carpinteria, Lompoc, and Santa Maria have had very successful open streets. You can get an idea of what I can see. That's, uh, that's Cabrillo Boulevard down there. But the kinds of activities, there's some three-wheel trikes at the bottom, the kinds of activities that we're going to be promoting for uh, both kids, well, prenatal to seniors. Um, here's a map. This is Santa Barbara. You can see Cabrillo Boulevard. They're usually set up with different kinds of zones, so there might be one that's music and dance. We expect to have live music at this event. Uh, things for younger kids, rock climbing walls, uh, etc. wellness booths, um, but it's usually set up by zones. Here's Lompoc's uh, zone map with some of the um, Photos from that event as well, so you can see there was dance and uh, rock climbing, could be skateboarding. There's a, we're looking at between 100 and 200 booths. This year it will be on Avenue the Flags. Some more examples, um, hopefully multicultural and inclusionary. Here's folkloric dancing, here's some cheerleaders. Uh, it can include a lot of active events. Proposed future SBC, Santa Barbara County Open Streets events. Santa Maria is March 29th, State Street, May 7th, Guadalupe. We're going to be coordinating some of our advertising uh, with Guadalupe. Guadalupe is also being sponsored by uh, Traffic Solutions. There's the event for the San Ynez Valley this year, Buellton Open Streets, Sunday, October 4th, 2020. It'll be from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And it'll be a Galita Open Streets in 2021. Budget, total budget for the event is uh, $50,000, 10000 We expect to come from in-kind donations, $40,000 in cash. And uh, City of Buellton is signed on as a $5,000 cash donor, $5,000 in-kind, which includes uh, sheriff security uh, for the day, um, traffic barriers, etc. I think we proposed to you a $5,000 sponsorship, $3,500 in cash, $1,500 to also help. I don't think Buellton has enough barriers for, for the day, so hopefully some help uh, from Public Works uh, delivering some barriers to Buellton, which we, of course will deliver back to Solvang. Um, and I'm sorry, again, just to clarify, right ahead. You, um, you requested how much again from uh, A $5,000 sponsorship made up of $3,500 in cash, check or money order, and $1,500 in kind in uh, traffic barriers. Thank you. So we're so uh, Buellton has uh, donated 5000 in cash uh, this year and uh, 5000 in in kind, including sheriffs, um, 
SBCAG Traffic Solutions gave us the initial seed money at $10,000. Who did I leave out so far? Let me introduce them while I see them. <laughs> so from our, from our uh, committee, our Open Streets Committee, which is part of the HEAL Coalition, Tommy Spidell from the YMCA, one of the co-conveners. I'm the other co-convener for HEAL. Don't ask me how I did. And we're also, people helping people is the administrator because we have the 501c3 nonprofit certification. We collect the money and account for the money in case you're worried about where the money's going and how it's accounted for. It's a, it's a good, legitimate question. And Kelly Fiore, who just got selected as our event manager. We sent out an RFP, went through the process of checking them and selected uh, Kelly to be our event manager. Have I left anything out? Fuelton Rotary is considering a $5,000 request, so hopefully we'll be about two-thirds towards our uh, fundraising goal. Questions? Do have any questions of the council? It, and you'd be closing streets in Solvang? This we is actually the first one will be in Buellton. Right? First one will be in Buellton, but ultimately when we come to Solvang, we'll have to meet to decide what streets would be closed to traffic. That's a third rail. Can be. Doesn't have to be. But it is. So this is basically a community-focused event. Commun completely family and community-focused event. That's exactly. another third rail. Community? <laughs> no. <laughs> when we try and do things for the community, we tend to get blowback from, um. from some groups. <laughs> for the locals, I mean. Don't worry about the doomsday. It sounds like a great <laughs> idea. So um, have you approached um, Solving Rotary and Los Olivos we, Rotary? As soon as we uh, get the amount from uh, Buellton, one good thing is I'm the president of the foundation, so it's kind of easy to make a presentation. And actually, it was the Buellton Rotary last year that hosted the first Open Streets event, bringing together members of uh, all across the communities uh, in the valley to learn about what Open Streets is. So our uh, Rotary Foundation is very excited to participate in this. Once we know what that level is, we would do the same we're doing with the cities, which is since it's not in Solvang, or in San Inez for the San Inez Rotary or Los Olivos, we would ask them for a lower amount of contribution until we move it to their, uh, within their boundaries. Okay, um, I'd also suggest that you approach the San Inez Valley Elks Lodge yes, 2640. Yes, on our list we have probably. Because we get a specific grant for the drug awareness and uh -huh. activities for children specifically. Awesome. So, so we also are in the midst of applying to the uh, San Inez Valley uh, Chumash Foundation for a significant lead uh, sponsorship. So again, I'm trying to understand what yes, your, your ask is here. You're trying to ask for money that will help create awareness for people to get out and exercise. Is that what I'm led and to understand? And to learn, learn about healthy eating, right? Various active living lifestyle recreation activities. That's correct. We are. Could you describe a little more the event layout for the first one that's going to be happening in um, Bealts? And that might help the count. Because I, I remember this initially came yeah, up with I Mayor Holly that. Sierra and I talking about it. And she kind of laid out more or less the, the vision for Bealton this year. So we're going to help the council here today. All but the first island on uh, Avenue of Flags will be blocked off all the way up to Damasa Road. So there'll be no no through traffic, no cross traffic. On how does that help legs. you with your vision here, your your mission? How does it help? You, how does it eating achieve, active living? Yeah, how do you teach people to eat healthier and, and be more active it's about by getting them on the streets? It's about getting them excited when they are able to participate in, in something. So you're going to create events. Learn about, huh? You're going to create events that get well, them involved. There'll be more booths that will get them involved. In dance so activities. why don't you why don't you do this in conjunction with some other type of event? Well, we're doing it sort of in conjunction with another event, which is in Buellton. They have participated in Earth Day in the past, and we will have an Earth Day area for them as well because they just can't uh, bring to bear the resources necessary to have a separate Earth Day event. So it makes a lot of sense. You're correct to uh, to do that at the same time. But this is a little different than it. It's not the typical street festival with lots of food for sale, those kinds of things. It's really to get kids and families involved in activities the day of the event, hmm. as you saw from the photos. So you might have things like a rock climbing wall or, we'll yeah. Almost definitely have a rock climbing wall. Yeah. We will probably have the tricycles. We'll have some uh, bike races around the uh, uh, 
area like they did sort of a mini criterium that uh, Buellton has done in the past. Uh, folkloric dancing, what do you have, jazzercise, all kinds of so ways why, to get involved. Why do we need to close down streets? Why not do this at a public facility like a school? Because of the size of the event. The number of booths, the size of the event, the ability to cycle or walk around the event, that's another way of getting people involved. We need to close yeah. those I streets. think another issue is making it very, very visual. They want to have it very right. visual too. You want to be able to see it from everywhere. So the idea when, when I heard about it was putting the rock wall down next to the main road on Avenue of the Flag so that people, everyone driving by can see it and just to get more exposure that way. Whereas if you do it at a school, it's enclosed and less people will see it. Well, you'd have very limited space. You wouldn't be able to do the cycling and those kinds of things. I think it's great. Excited to see how it goes in Bilton. So thank you. We are excited as well. Yeah. So so next steps with regard to if the council were to desire to support the open streets, um, I'll call it initiative here. There's the first one that's in Bilton. and I think then the long term plan is then to have one here in Solvane and then somewhere else in the Santinez Valley, maybe the next Correct. year after. Yep. And then um, rotate back again. So <clears throat> the council is also making changes to kind of how we fund things, and, and some of that's through uh, IDK. So I don't know, Zena, if you have anything, or Chip, if you have anything to comment on how best to move forward with any support on open on the open streets to item. Sure, I think we definitely have plenty of time to work with you for 2021, and uh, IDK, given the next item on the agenda, actually would be helping the city with all the logistics of holding the events, you know, working with the city on street closures, making sure that, you know, it satisfies the needs of the events as well as best serves the rest of the community and the business community. So we would just probably ask you to submit a formal request to us as to, you know, what dates would work for you and we would work with you through IDK to uh, work through the logistics and the funding for this. For 2021. Would the, would the council entertain some support for 2020? The object is it's a sending as valley wide event that we'll be moving around? Or with with regard to, to financial support, the, you're like built in financing for 5,000, is that what? I'm, I'm asking I'm for 3,500 since you're not yeah, the host, it, right. host city. Since right. this is only a presentation, I'm hearing that this is not on the agenda, but um, you can definitely work with me and through IDK on yeah. putting your request forward and we'll work Sounds with good. it. That's kind of what I was going earlier with it, just with the changes that we're making, that it's more appropriate they go through that channel versus right. directly with the council. But I like the idea. Yeah. Very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. We'll get together. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you. We have a Fall Fest presentation. I was requested from Andreas that that gets pushed to the next uh, agenda. I think he had some family things that came up. And then we have a 5G presentation by Michael Mendeza. If you would like to come up and give us a. Yeah. Yes. yes, yeah, sorry. It was going to be Fall Fest, but they requested to be on the next agenda. So, so I have a, a document on your laptop that hopefully we can share. <coughs> it's basically a Word document. So while she's looking for that, um, my, my purpose for being here is to request that the city of Solvang place a moratorium on the implementation or testing of 5G technology until it's proven safe. That's as simple as it is. Rather than let it get rolled out, which is normally what industry does, and then we have to try to reel it back, I'm saying there's significant documentation over decades that, that there are some deep concerns about health and environment and the biosphere that the 5G technology represents. So that's basically the request. The second request is that you reevaluate the existing placement of the cell towers that are in the what used to be the um, antique center. Now it's being converted to a hotel. There are two cell towers that are more or less hidden on top of that and then a brand new one that just went in on top of the Viking restaurant. 
So my request of you is to reevaluate the placement of those so that they're moved to safer areas where they may not be, you know, my, my staff and my employees are right underneath that at Z Folio and at the Olive Press. So those are my two requests. So what I'd like to do basically and simply is to skim the document that I presented to you um, the last time I was here. So you have copies of this material, but I'd just like to kind of review why I think this is a significant challenge and something that would be really great or important for you to be aware of and also to take action on. Um, the, the real game changer has took place last year um, when the California Supreme Court ruled in favor of municipalities having jurisdiction over the, over the implementation of these kinds of technologies. This was a huge thing because up until then, industry had a pretty much carte blanche card. They, they, they could do whatever they wanted. But now it's been reverted back to you. So you do have the authority given the Supreme Court ruling to, um, regul or to, to choose whether or not these technologies are, are implemented in your community or not. So the, the ball is in your court from the, the Supreme Court. Um, if you'll scroll down to the next page, please. So you'll see here just a brief list of some of the health issues that have been shown in literally tens of thousands of independent studies. And they include cancers, DNA damage, autism, um, all kinds of things. So there's a whole litany of biological impacts, health impacts on the human body, as well as on the bees, you know, there, there's, there's all kinds of things that are going on with natural things. If you'll scroll down a little further, um, by the way, it was April 4th of uh, 2019 that the, that the uh, California Supreme Court um, made its uh, ruling. So the image here is basically showing those hidden cell towers um, where they are. So I walk by there all day long. Um, if you'll scroll to the next image, basically what this is showing, uh, I used to have an office in Frederick's Court, and the image on the side there is of a, just a little meter, a couple hundred dollar meter, and you'll see that the arrow is pegging way into the red. Now that is measuring the, the output of the existing towers from my office door in Frederick's Court. From the, from the facility that's right, you know, 100 yards away. So if you'll scroll down a little further, the reason that this is significant is this, this, this is a series of images of a chart that kind of shows you what we're talking about in terms of the intensity of current levels. Now we're not talking about 5G, we're really talking about current levels, 3G and 4G. So at the 05 rating, it, with children, you're having, um, uh, circulation difficulties, behavior difficulties, so on and so forth. The next image shows at, at 01, doubling that exposure. This is where your laptops and Wi-Fi's, you have sperm damage at a DNA level, uh, decreased sperm viability, et cetera. We go to the next image, please. So now we're gonna go up to 2.5, um, altered calcium and metabolism in the heart muscle being affected by this low level of radiation. Then you go to the next, which is 6.0 DNA damage in cells. What, most, what was most troubling by the researchers who have looked at this for decades has to do with women, has to do with young girls, because they take their laptop and they put them in their lap. Now, what they're doing is taking a, they're basically taking their ovaries and putting them in a microwave oven and cooking them while they play with their game. That's what's going on with these things. They've, they've taken in high schools and done readings of 20 kids who have laptops and tablets. Now you have 20 microwave uh, you know, devices that are all emitting this, and you, you basically literally are cooking the whole kids. All the kids are being cooked for an hour in that room at, at the, uh, like being in a little microwave oven. That's really what's going on. The next slide is the one that's really significant. Now, the previous slides are those little squares on the side. Industry has lobbied 10,000% 10, uh, 10, or degrees higher frequencies than 
the research shows causes damage. So the levels that research that the industry says is where we're setting our standards is 10,000 plus times higher than the damage that we showed you with the previous slides. And if you read your, read your instruction book on your cell phone and on your computer, if you dig deep into it, they say, well, yes, of course you shouldn't have it close to your body because it emits radiation and it's going to harm you. So they say that, but nobody reads it and they put their phones and so on and so forth. So there's no question that, that, these, that these technologies are dangerous and harmful. Um, and the, given the amount of exposure that we're all used to now, um, you know, how <laughs> we didn't have cell phones a little while ago. It's only been in a really short period of time that, that the whole world now has been coated with these Wi-Fi and electromagnetic and microwave technologies. So the next slide basically says, uh, this is showing the, the new installation that, go, that went on top of the Red Viking just a few months back. Um, the next image, if we go to the next page, this is, this is um, the G 5G installation um, showing the guys putting in the test site. This was on Adderdag and Mission. If you scroll up a little bit further, please, it shows you the hub site, which is up on Chalk Hill, and then the two towers in the bottom. I just talked with these guys this morning. I was just walking to my office, and they were testing, and they said, well, they're going to remove these things. This is for a test period. Um, and I said, well, that's fine. Um, so those are going to go out next week or something. So they put it in for a test. Um, my request, again, is that you guys put a moratorium on testing and implementation of 5G till it's proven safe. Um, the next slide is just to give some credibility to the kinds of people who have been looking at these things. Oh, here's, this is, um, these curved little wing guys are drones the size of a football field that they tested and have been testing in Hawaii. And just last week, they came out with a notice saying that now they're coming to California. So the idea here is that they're putting the 5G um, <coughs> units on, um, on, on these drones. They'll be flying the drones overhead. If you go to the next image, please. Um, they will launch tens of thousands of satellites so that the entire Earth is going to be covered with this 5G. Um, there will be no place, not a square inch on the surface of the Earth that isn't radiated 24-7 by 5G technology. Next image, please. This is a global issue of what the satellites are doing and how it's going to coat um, the entire planet. So the next image down here, you see these. The, oh, I'm not quite so fast. Um, these are the documents that I have posted on the website that were included in your package. And they basically represent a decade or more of research, documentaries, publications, this whole book is transcripts of uh, some of the leading experts in the field globally on the subject. Um, so you have a tremendous, um, you know, resource right here. They're a click away and you can, you can avail yourself of all the information you need on this. We'll go forward, please. These are just some highlights, Robert F. Kennedy and then t all the rest of these peoples are uh, physicians, PhDs, people who are basically concerned and are publishing and are advocating that, that this moratorium not just be in Solvang, but they want a moratorium globally on what's going on um, for, for these health-related issues. Um, and then the last one, the last document that, that we can highlight, if you go a little further, is a, is a, um, a well-written paper that basically gives you an overview of the technology, its consequences, what the plans are. It's fairly technical, but um, th that's the resource for you. So um, as I've shared with you before, I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, I have a little nonprofit called Touch the Future, and I've been interviewing people in the field of child and human development for the last 35 years. And I have to say that I'm astonished with the caliber of people that I've been in touch with um, and interviewing. These are the people who are writing the books and publishing the papers and really doing the research on how these technologies are affecting our children. You know, and as you know, I have a five-year-old daughter. So I'm keenly aware of what these technologies are doing and many of the school systems are pulling 
the existing levels out. They would they put the cell towers in the schools. They they are taking them out. There are uh, I think Belgium and uh, several other European countries have banned it. There have been people in the United Nations who have said that this is a terrible thing. It's it's terrible to to coat the whole earth. People have no choice. The the technology is up there and is irradiating them every day. Um, so this is a huge issue. So I'm asking you to be proactive in being preventative um, until it's proven safe. That's all. I don't want you to, you know, if it's great, if it's great, use it, you know, but if it's dangerous, I want you to prevent, prevent it from coming in until it's proven safe. That's my request. Are there any questions of the council of presenter or staff? Kind of, do you have one? Yeah. Um, so are you saying that 3G and 4G have been proven safe? No. Okay, so none of this stuff has been proven safe. None of it. 3G and 4G are not safe. That's at the current level of, you know, people are really now, now, but now it's been around long enough to gather the data. Um, you should not put the cell phone next to your head. And you can see in some of the documentation that it's not the heat that's being produced from it, but the microwave is penetrating and going inside the brain. Children's brains are more sensitive, and, and so the lower frequency affects the child more than it would an adult. But it's, it's basically causing tumors, and it's causing problems there. Um, one of the ubiquitous things that most people are unaware of it, that, that I think is amazing, um, how many people have a, a Wi-Fi in their home? Everyone. Most everybody, right? How many of you turn it off at night? Do you turn off the Wi-Fi at night? No one. No one. You know, well, the brain, you, you're don't, you don't feel or your brain doesn't sense, or shall I say you don't consciously sense the pulsing that's being generated by that unit. If they take a meter that amplifies that, it's, it's, just, it's just radiating, uh, but you don't hear it or feel it. Right. Your brain does. And what that frequency is doing to your brain is tricking the brain into thinking that it's still daylight. Now, what that does is it represses your melatonin system. Melatonin is probably one of the most important um, immune functions that you have. Not only does it help you with your sleep regulation, which most people are aware of, but it's also one of the most active catalysts for the immune system. That doesn't get produced if it's in daylight. So when you have your Wi-Fi on, you're inducing sleep disorders, you're not sleeping as deeply, your melatonin is not being produced. So, and that's every day, 24-7. So there are thousands, like I said, of reports of at current levels. Right. Now, the big issue is that the 5G is an exponential increase, not only in the intensity, but in the, in the frequency realm that it's actually it's being used and totally untested. There has not been one test to show that, that this stuff has been safe, is safe. Not one test. Any place in the world has been conducted to show that this technology is safe for has, us. Has anyone successfully sued some of these companies that are doing this due to these harmful effects? So industry, you're, well, you're bucking telecom, telecom Pentagon. Well, I know there's a lot of money behind right? it, yeah. So basically, just um, I'll bring up, just like they did with the vaccination, industry has got a, 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 a get out of jail for free card, right? So they said you cannot, you could not until the, this, um, until Supreme the California Court. Supreme Court ruled giving you the power, you could not not allow the tech companies to put it in because of um, harmful physical effects. That was negated, right? You couldn't do it. That could not be a reason for doing it. The Supreme Court overturned that. That was the big game changer that's going on. So um, I tell you what. And read it between now and nine. Well, that will answer your question. Hey. I have a question. Mike? Robert? Um, Mike, I appreciate all that you do, and I, I trust you. Um, what you're saying sounds really Chernobyl-ish, and, and I, I devour public 
I devour news and I devour current events, everything except council meetings. And why am I only hearing about this in this room? Why isn't this? Why don't you hear about it from the CDC? I, do, I know you're going to say that the big, powerful telecom companies, but why is this the only place that I'm hearing about this? I mean, what what you're saying is pretty doomsday, and I don't I don't see anything about it on the news. I don't I don't hear about it other than out of from you. And I appreciate what you do. You've done your homework. Well, but why are we not hearing this anywhere else? Well, because most of the public forums are run by the people who are going to benefit both financially and technologically from the rollout of this. But why is there no news on this other than here? Well, no, no, there is. I mean, I, like I said, that book right there, right? Borrow. Right. That website, my, my, that, my, there is plenty out there. Mm -hmm. You're just not going to get it in, in what they call mainstream media. I find that so hard to believe. Uh, well, G Google and Facebook mm -hmm. are, are so censoring it. censoring data. They're censoring anything that they don't want out. Has the CDC researched this at all? Yeah, the FDA has. Well, yeah. The, yeah. Okay. The, I mean, again, I'm I'll, not doubting you at all. Do me a big favor. Take, Read the book. Take an hour. Okay. Go to the site that's right here. Mm -hmm. It's ttfuture.org. You go to the academy, click cell towers, and just spend a little bit of time going through this. And this is like the tip of the iceberg that I have. <laughs> this is just what I happen to cherry pick and pull together out of mountains. But the book that I just gave him here is a great example. Those are the leading experts in the world talking about and answering all the questions that you're talking about. Then I have one last question. Uh, are other municipalities taking your heat and, and, and standing up to? Yes, I think even Ryan called and said that there was a group of people in, or cities in California that well, were looking at doing yeah. that? Well, I knew that League of California Cities was involved with I, something it came up on one of their agendas there but it was just I think it might have been more around the lobbying for allowing more local control I think you mentioned a Supreme Court case a little bit earlier so any other cities have blocked or yes or, yeah, yeah. yes uh, yeah. I know o Oakland I, for sure Oakland um, um, I believe Mill Valley um, I think I read something about that um, but I just wanted to say something um, regarding you know that you haven't heard anything in the news about this um, just take for example when uh, let's take cigarettes for example which is a good analogy that who came out with back in the World Health Organization came out with a statement back in 2011 and they said um, the effects of uh, the radiation from our uh, personal handheld devices um, may not be known for a number of years, like the effects of cigarette smoking. It took 20, 25 years for people to um, correlate the effects of smoking to cancer. So I believe what uh, the gentleman is saying right now is that we just don't know what the real dangers are, and we may not know for years. We may not know the effects of that for years. So and if I may, there's, there's, if there's I a may. lot of data on. There's a lot of data to support what he's saying. There's also data that's that, you know, there's two sides to every story. So there's a this there's a a, a gentleman who's been focusing on this internationally. He's with the same organization that puts out the Nobel Prize. He's one of the leading experts in this field, and he has been for two decades. Ali Jacobson, Jacobson, something like that. Um, and I have transcripts here of him meeting in Barcelona with MDs talking about the known proven harm and damage that these microwave um, radiation is causing. So I, I would challenge um, Mrs. White or Ms. White on the, the, that it's not known. It's not out because the people who benefit from it run the cable stations and they run the network. So the media, main, mainstream media outlets are not going to take this on. You're not going to get it that way. You're going to have to just go look for it. And then it, it, the jack comes out of the box. It's all over the place. There's tons. And there's plenty here, I promise you. So be safe. Just be safe. Don't be sorry. Just be safe. So where do you recommend we go to look for these reports that are going to tell us that it's okay to use 5G? Because you've given us a whole list of reasons not to use it, but you've encouraged us to go look for reasons that would show that it is safe. No, I'm not. In, I, I so don't, you don't think you don't, I don't think in you, any you circumstance. Can't, you it's can't not safe. find any that say it's safe. Right. Even though we've had 30 plus years 
a proof that people are using cell phones and it's not causing the, the terrible cancer rates that you, people have been afraid of? Well, I disagree. I mean, you know, there's, okay, well, oh, you know, I get I, it. But until you show that regular cell phone usage is causing massive rates of cancer, I got a problem with this. So I don't mind listening to your presentation. I think it's, it's well worth listening to. But we're not hearing the other side. So where's the other side? What is the I other don't know. Side? I would besides, love, for, I would love to hear that side. Right? Before we make any decision as a council, I would recommend to my council members we hear both sides of the conversation. <laughs> is there any harm if there's, if there's f upwards of 40,000 papers, independent scientific papers, that are saying that these things are dangerous? Upwards close to 40,000 papers. Is there any harm in you as a body saying, okay, let's just not put it in here until, it's, until we can find out if it's safe? Right? So you're asking our staff to become experts no, in 5G? No, I'm asking 5G. for you, the council. To, to become individual experts? Not a bit. I'm asking for you to simply say, let's not, put the let's not allow this technology in my, our community so you're saying until, because, until, because there are 40,000 hey plus hey, reports. Until it's proven safe. Chris, just let him finish. I'm trying to make my point. He's had 10, 15 minutes to speak. I'm trying to make my point. Just because there are 40,000 reports, according to your estimate, I'm not saying you're right or wrong. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's the conclusive uh, summary. I mean, maybe there is a reason for you to say this. I just like to see professionals speak to this. Are you a professional in this area? I'm not a professional. In that's area. right. So I'm suggesting to the council, we probably need more advice from professionals from both sides that can speak to one side or the other. So why why do you need why do you need, Mr. Mayor? I, I think at some point again I, I'm this, trying to reel that in. Agendized I'm, as public communication, right. not yes. an action item or debate. Leave it as that. So if you all want to bring this back as an action item, you could direct the city manager to bring back an action item. I would note that we have reviewed this issue, uh, at least to a certain extent, and the city, in fact has an ordinance that regulates um, cell towers that it looks like was not actually followed in the past. And so your new manager is in the process of actually uh, getting the cell tower providers to comply with your city's ordinance. And I've looked at the case that has been talked about from the California Supreme Court, um, assuming that I have the right one, which concerns the city and county of San Francisco, and there was only one such case in 2019. It actually confirmed prior law, and I think that, I actually think that your ordinance complies with the direction the Supreme Court provided. And again, you could direct staff to bring a presentation and an action item back on this, which would be the appropriate thing to do at this point if you want further information or consideration. Yeah, you, actually, you have to hear both sides of everything before we vote on anything. Again, right now, other than putting this on a future agenda, you don't have yeah, this agenda correct. to take action. So it sounds like you're already working on that ordinance for the council to eventually review and, and adopt. Would you be running that by the planning commission first? Uh, actually, you have an ordinance. It's just, and we don't understand exactly why, but it appears, um, Zena, correct me if I'm wrong, but it appears that your prior planning staff did not actually require the permits that the ordinance would seem to require. That Shocking. was Holly Owens. So, so maybe we should just review that and bring it back to the council, discuss that. I think the only question here is that with the current 5G equipment going in, was that uh, permitted or is it? No. That was not, and so we are actually working with them, asking them to remove and then go through the appropriate process with the city. Good. And then, of course, we can look at the ordinance itself as well and see if that's sufficient and bring forth some recommendations or Yeah, I think we've discussion. got two problems here. One is why did they violate the CUP that they were they're working under? And two, we need to know more about 5G, both sides of the argument. Agreed. So I, I think the appropriate thing at this point is let staff finish up their work, bring it back to the, the council or planning commission first, and then 
put on the agenda. Go follow through the processes because it sounds like the current processes weren't being followed anyway. So, right, agree. Okay, so thank you. May I ask just um, so how do we actually get it? What do we have to do in order to get this to come to a a decision. A decision, right? That's what I thought today was. was no, it's it? got to be an agenda item. Well, we we got to go through the, right. the processes of it. I mean, even right. I as mayor can scream up and down that I no, want. No, 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 no. I long. understand. I mean, <laughs> I, that's why I'm asking what what is required yeah. in order to to bring so this through, so that you can make a decision through the process of allowing staff to reevaluate those ordinances. The council can do further research on what you've you know shown here tonight, and if they desire to make policy changes, for example, that limit 5G during that ordinance policy discussion then that would be the the time when that would then happen but this is kind of like the start of educating um, can I be informed of the various steps of the oh, yeah. process oh, absolutely. so that I yes. can you know at least know what's going yeah. on that would Th be great. this gives our staff direction to actually work on that great yeah. great thank you much thank, thank you, you Mike thank you Thanks, all right on to Matt I'll let you if you want to add something to it uh, good evening, Mayor Tassant, Council Members. I was just going to clarify that um, Verizon Wireless is, uh, has submitted an application an for an encroachment permit to properly remove the three uh, units that they installed recently. We received that application late Friday. We're going to be issuing their encroachment permit to remove the three existing units uh, uh, shortly after that. And then they're being directed, as our um, city manager indicated, uh, Verizon has been required to submit an application to the planning department for reinstallation of those. So that eventually will come back to you uh, for your action and decision. So. There you go. All right. So you're already having an impact. <laughs> and he's welcome to speak at the planning commission as well. Chris Nielsen, filed, uh, followed by Michael Baker. Good evening, Mayor Toussaint and fellow council members. I uh, appreciate your attention and the opportunity to uh, address a little bit of misinformation that was passed at the previous council meeting in regards to the Theater Fest. Uh, first, in particular, was the Theater Fest support of Yule Fest. October 1st, 2019, there was a planning meeting with uh, Marianne Norvon, the executive director of the Theater Fest, and Scott. Uh, Schumach and uh, Daniel Lair of IDK and Councilman DeJernis. This meeting was held at the Theater Fest office and during this meeting it was identified that the Theater Fest would be available for Yule Fest for up to 25 of the 30 days in December. So why it was addressed that the Solvang Theater Fest turned the city down I don't understand why that statement was made, when in fact it was quite the opposite. Theater Fest was happy to have been able to support Yule Fest, but we never heard back after that meeting. Uh, another item was that, uh, you know, the Theater Fest, we work hard on a shoestring budget, and although we really wish our fundraiser concerts made a ton of money, in fact, uh, for 2019, we had two very successful concerts. I hope you were able to attend Clint Black and Scotty McCreary. Combining those two, the net proceeds of those events for the Theater Fest was $78,000. 40000 of those $78,000 was risen as sponsorships by the hard work of the staff of the Theater Fest and the board members going out to individuals and businesses in the community to have them help sponsor those concerts so they would be a financial success for the Theater Fest. Just didn't raise a ton of money. Mm -hmm. And if you have any performers that you think we can get in here that will raise a ton of money, we're all ears. Um, and also, we are very, very happy to be able to report that our capital campaign to raise $4.7 million for the renovation of the theater so that the Theater Fest will not only be here for another 46 years, but will actually be enhanced and an even better experience for all those involved. Uh, we are about 45% to our funding goal of 4.7. Wow, That's good. A lot of hard work. Um, we've got great leadership within our capital campaign. 
many individuals and organizations in our community have donated to help us raise those dollars. We're still a long ways to go, but we're very happy with the success we've had so far. These are individuals and organizations that understand what the Theatre Fest is to our community. It's not just where PCPA plays during the summer, but it's also where other very important organizations in our community come to raise their dollars for their essential mission, whether it be Friendship House, whether it be Rotary, whether it be City of Solvang and City of Bealton Youth Rec. We extend ourselves to support our community so that organizations like those have the best opportunity for success. And to do that, we have a heavily discounted rate that they pay to come and use Theater Fest. And in fact, City of Solvang, we shut down the Theater Fest for three weeks during a prime season when we can do fundraisers, and that's in October. We shut down the Theater Fest for three weeks so Fred can come in and start setting up for the haunted house. And we charge less than one third of what the going rate is. We want to help our community because that's what the Theater Fest is here for. It's here for our community. It was created by the community. And we look forward to all the great things that we have to come. So thank you for your time. I just wanted to clear the air on a couple of those very important factors and thank you for what you all do. Hey, Thanks, Chris, Chris, while I have you here, it's a great update, but um, also I, I do notice that sometimes council members get confused between Theater Fest and PCPA, and while you're here, can you just explain that so that for everyone's... I certainly can, and you know it's not just <laughs> council members. There's many of us who are born and raised here yeah. that never realize that Solvang Festival Theater and PCPA are two completely separate organizations. They have a deep and long partnership going back 46 years. PCPA is the talent that comes down from Allen Hancock College and performs during the summers. The Theater Fest is the building, it's the venue. And although there's, like I say, a very strong partnership that's been successful every single year for 46 years between those two entities, they are separate entities. So that's why when it comes to fundraising, I've had many people say, oh, Chris, I love the Theater Fest. I sent you a check for a donation. Uh, it was PCPA, right? <laughs> no, so that's that's an educational challenge we have in the here in the community that's just perpetual. There's there's many people that have that misperception, and it'll probably go it'll probably never go away. But I want to give you another opportunity to explain to the public the difference between the two. <laughs> and thank you. We need all the opportunity. And we can. if you can shoot us an email to tell us how to help in that, I, I'd be very receptive. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Cool. I think absolutely. you should be talking with IDK about that. But since IDK is in the room, and since he was there along with me, I would like for him to actually address your your issue. I think you're taking issue with me. You think that I was Mr. Mayor, you of something? I, this, no, Chris, you this know. is public comment, so just yeah. let it, it... Well, he made an accusation. No, no, no I, sure I'm I sorry. I, I want to, because this is, is a confusing issue about the Brown Act. The public has a chance to speak. I know sometimes it can be very frustrating right. to not be able to respond, but you actually... You're not allowed to, to get into debate on the public communication item. All right. So what I'll do is I'll respond then in writing um, to Mr. Nielsen. You can and follow to up the individually best. with. Right. And I'll have IDK, since they were there, All I'll right. have them respond with me. Thank you, Chris. Thank Thanks, you. Chris. My pleasure. Thank you for your really attention. Really appreciate it. Michael Baker. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Michael Baker, CEO of United Boys and Girls Clubs. Uh, I just wanted to come and give you an update on uh, everything that's happening with the uh, Boys and Girls Club. Our location here in Solvang is thriving. Uh, we are actually now over 80 members enrolled. Uh, our goal was to get to about 60 kids by this point, so we're a little bit ahead of schedule, which is a good thing. Uh, but uh, those of you that have any children, I, I can't emphasize this enough, and this has actually happened with the school district, any children that desperately need our services, we are not going to turn them away for any reason whatsoever. We want to make sure that we're there to help the kids that need our services the most. Um, so if you know of a child that's in need of a safe place to go after school, parents might be working uh, one, two, three jobs, uh, and they need, they need a place for their child to go, please reach out to, uh, to me. Um, you can reach me 
uh, at the office at 805-681-1315. Again, that's 805-681-1315. And we'll make sure that we get those children enrolled in our program for free. Uh, we want to make sure that we're there for all children, but especially those that need our services the most. We want to encourage you to come down to the uh, club location at the uh, elementary school, on the elementary school campus, and uh, see, see what's happening. Um, and uh, I think you'll be very proud of um, uh, what's happening on a daily basis. I know that your city manager has a child that attends the program. I just might put that out there. Two. Um, and I think it's, so it's working out very well. So, again, want to uh, thank you for your continued support. Thank, thank you. You. you bet. All right, that's the end of public communications. With that, we'll move on to item number two, executive PI reports and advanced calendar. Who would like to start? I believe we have a city manager report today, and I would like to first start by looking at the advanced calendar. The next regular meeting is scheduled for February 10th at the regular scheduled meeting of 630. Um, I would, today we will be looking at uh, a, an item approving a contract with IDK. I think that at the next calendar I would like to have an update with IDK and some of the original uh, recommendations and steps forward. Then we also have, we'll have bring an update on the amnesty pr program for building. So just wanted to bring that to the council attention and also highlight it once again for our community that the amnesty program is in place as of January 1st. And currently we'll run through June 30th. We have had some positive feedback on that so far. We got three um, fairly large projects going through uh, our planning department um, and building department going through their permitting process from the business community. We also have some citizens starting to approach the department with questions on that from residential community. We have some confused folks sometimes coming from county and outside of solving, so we have to say sorry, but this is only ap applicable to our jurisdiction in the city of solving. And so staff is currently working on preparing some additional materials so we can have some additional flyers and information on the website to even further promote this program. And basically the program is for uh, everyone to be able to come to the city and not have to pay penalties on unpermitted building projects. We will also have an update on the wastewater treatment plant engineering and design contract uh, that would be an actually action item for the council for to approve the contract for engineering and design. You have about $1.2 million uh, towards that project authorized right now. And so staff has gone through competitive bidding, has selected three top competitors, they have interviewed it, and they're in the final stages of selecting the final uh, proposal and we'll bring that to council for authorization. Then the Public Works is also working on a South Aliso Road repavement project. That's the project to repave the South Aliso Road. Uh, we are currently in engineering for that process and I just wanted to bring that to council attention that um, there's been some discussion in the past as to whether the council wanted to have full-on bike lanes there or just uh, I believe they're called the series the signs that say it's a shared road between vehicles and bikes so this would be the last opportunity for council to hear the update to hear the costs and to have that opportunity if you wanted to move forward with something different and consider the full-on bike lanes for that project uh, we also have, as you know, the state of California has pretty much um, allowed the ADU units um, and until there's very limited ability for cities to regulate those, but staff will be bringing in some recommendations for those areas that we can regulate. It will be going to a planning commission first and then we will be coming to the council. Then we have the Lot 72 policy direction. So with some of the events and with our uh, Yule Fest, we've had some discussions about the use of that lot. So we want to bring forth to the council the current arrangement and the contract regarding the Lot 72 and what that can or cannot be used for and get an update from you on policy direction, how you want to proceed with that going forward. Finally, we'll have uh, financial policies adoption as well as the vehicle city vehicle use policy for council consideration of financial policies is really something that goes along with you know the financial plan it will look at purchasing budgeting and some other uh, policy recommendations and as part of that financial prudent uh, type of financial policies we will also look at how we use city vehicles and how many we need etc 
Then moving on to February 27th, um, we will anticipate to be completed with the organizational assessment. We will present the findings to the council, which will once again feed into the next financial plan development and really looking at the organization, how do we do more with less and really pr um, perform our services as a city in the most efficient way. Uh, part of that, will, as in subsequent to that, will be the public information officer or maybe communications, RFP scope, it will be informed by the overall organizational structure as well as the needs and recommendation for information technology. Then we'll have an update following from the last council special meeting on economic development, so working with Cosmont on a specific site of the Vets Hall um, and also giving recommendations for overall economic development. We'll come back to you with a process to date at that point in time, which then will also we have applied for the SB2 grant for uh, general update or certain elements for the general plan update as well as for permitting software implementation. So I would expect us to hear whether or not we have received those funds by that point and then we can move forward with RFP scope for the general plan update and also begin with the permitting software implementation. In addition to that, we have the council previous direction to look into the BAR restructure, which also goes along with potentially looking at some of the elements on the planning commission. So as early as February, maybe into March, staff will be bringing to you back working with a subcommittee on the BAR restructure, some recommendations as to how those two functions could be best structured to serve city of Solving. Other updates, we are working on a state of the city actually aligned with the League of California Cities that is going to be here hosted by the City of Solomon on February 28th. So this year the city is taking a little bit more of a proactive role in coordinating the program and setting up for the state of the city. So that is planned for February 28th. I would expect that before the next council agenda, we'll have all the details and we'll start advertising and really letting the public and everybody in the community know about the program and inviting them to be part of this process. And finally, we have a council regular meeting that might be of interest for council to be moved and rescheduled. It's March 23rd. We have had interest from three council members to uh, attend a conference on smart mobility conference outside of town, which would conflict with this date. So I wanna see if the council would like to consider potentially moving that date of regular meeting to the following Monday of March 30th. So if I can have a little show of hands whether you would like to move that meeting from the 23rd to the 30th. Uh, uh, <coughs> no. no, so. No, no, no. <coughs> It'd just be giving direction for staff to come back in the next meeting to reschedule the, uh, the meeting of March 23rd for, uh, so, it's not, so it's out of conflict with the SMART mobility conference that's taking place. I believe that's is that in San Diego? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. okay. It's in March. You got my nod. Correct. Okay, so we'll br bring back that. Okay, I think that's a consensus. And that concludes my presentation. I don't believe there is any other executive reports today. So my other, my only other item um, is with regard to Alice Hall Road, hearing that it's our last chance to have, for the council to have any input into what happens um, there. I know that one's kind of been tossed back and forth and around, and so I don't really know what that concrete plan is at this point. I think there was some question of it during the budget, um, but I thought that it was kind of locked down. So to hear that we could have discussion about it might be worthwhile at the next, uh, next meeting. Sure, we can definitely put that on the next agenda and give you all the details and have you fully informed, but yes, there's definitely opportunity for- Is there a consensus direction. for the uh, council yes. to do that? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, so we'll put that on the next agenda to discuss that. Maybe we leave it status quo or we adjust some things. All right, so now on to the consent. We have no other uh, executive reports? No. Nope, okay. On to item number three, consent agenda. 
Would anyone like to pull anything from the consent agenda? No. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as is. I'll second. It's been seconded. Member Tim Clark? Yes. Councilmember Diarnis? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Uh, Councilmember Waite? Yes. Mayor Chisholm? Yes. Motion to approve the consent calendar. Mayor Karras 5 0. Thank you. On to item number four. Can I get a title readout and staff report? Item number four, Mayor, members of the council, is the IDK contract approval for marketing and tourism services. City manager will make a brief introduction, followed by Mr. Shoemaker. So at the last council, council approved or delegated um, negotiations with IDK to move forward with marketing and tourism services to the mayor, city attorney, and city manager. We have worked with IDK to come up with recommendations, and they have submitted their proposal, which is included in your packet on page 77. And I would like Scott to come up and give us an overview of that proposal. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, hello. Nice to see you two weeks in a row. The so yes, uh, last so three meetings ago, uh, we gave you guys some recommendations post Jewel Fest. What we thought that the city needed to move forward from a tourism standpoint um, and from an experimental marketing standpoint. Uh, we talked last week about what those recommendations were, and then worked uh, over the last week and a half with. Uh, uh, the city manager and the mayor to come to kind of an agreement on how we can implement those. So uh, the agreement before you, um, first off, we're kind of excited about. Uh, we think that we're uh, uh, going to help and, you know, bring um, exciting local events to solving, uh, create some really strong processes around those events that I think will be good for everybody, businesses, residents, and, and uh, uh and tours, obviously. Um, our agreement is like 70-30 consultative versus actual production. So on the consultative side, one of the first pieces that we're going to do is build out a new Solving USA website. Um, as has been mentioned here, ad nausea, the, the website is not really, the UX on the website is, is not the greatest. Um, the data behind it is is fairly good. The SEO leading into it is is not perfect, but it's not terrible. So um, rather than scrap it, you know, uh, and start with a new domain name or a new um, plan altogether, we're going to build a new SolvingUSA.com website, which we're excited about, um, with a more modern and user friendly user experience. We hope to have that rolled out in the first 90 days. Um, Second thing that we're doing is establishing a non-binding community-based steering committee uh, to define experiential marketing goals across constituencies, uh, both retail, um, regular business, you know, wine business, and then residents and tourists, obviously. Um, we're going to continue to work with the city manager to create a updated fee matrix. Uh, as I mentioned in the last meeting, you know, if I wanted to come into town and close Copenhagen for a month, it would cost me $125 in a signature. Um, and so we want to update that uh, and make sure that it's it's representative of, of everybody in town. Um, we will continue to work with the city manager and uh, her delegates at Rec and Park to clean up the permitting process as a whole um, to sort of introduce some new standards around uh, recycling, cleanliness, uh, fire and health standards, uh, and crowd management. Um, probably most exciting for me uh, because a lot of the feedback that we've gotten from, from different constituents that we've been out chatting with is uh, the desire and sort of the unease with uh, these small local groups that are dependent on uh, city funds for, uh, you know, to produce events or to do concert series or whatever. Uh, so one of the things we're doing immediately in this first sort of month is setting aside $50,000 uh, and we'll work with the steering committee to grant out that money to local organizations, be it Rotary, be it Danish Days, be it um, small uh community nonprofit groups uh, to try and, and make sure that, that there's no uncertainty around uh, their continuing. Um, obviously within that, we uh, are gonna work with the steering committee to go establish KPIs around you know, the, the, uh, you know, that money in future years, ensuring uh, either TOT or sales tax increases, Danish culture, uh, or overall benefit to the locals. 
Uh, next in the agreement, we're supporting the city's tourism through digital marketing. Uh, so we'll continue working on all of our, uh, uh, you know, the city's efforts in digital. Um, we are super excited about some of the content that we already have in the pipeline um, and are, uh, are quite sure that six months from now we'll be able to show that we can uh, ensure that we're bringing the quote right tourists to solving uh, and, and making sure that everybody is, uh, is benefiting from those tourists. Um, Additionally, as I've said before, we have absolutely no desire to run a visitor center. We think that that Ms. Ball and her team are doing a fantastic job of that. Um, you know, should I personally believe that no city should force two businesses to work together. So should Brenda be uh, in a position that she'd like to, to work with us, we would love to support the visitor center with technology. Uh, I know there's there's uh, some things that that she would like to be able to do. So we want to continue supporting the visitor center. Uh, finally, on the consultative side, uh, we're going to establish a pathway for the city to create a fixed amount to spend annually on tourism so that there's no more confusion or question about whether something's in the budget or not. We're uh, recommending a set percentage of TOT is what gets spent on tourism. And then, of course, the city can decide uh, we'll make non-binding recommendations through the steering committee. But it, uh, in this upcoming budget process, uh, we're hopeful that the city will be able to determine, you know, what it's going to spend on tourism and, and sort of stick with it. Uh, then the balance is the fun stuff. That's the 30% of, of the agreement is, is us helping the city to, to produce some events. We have uh, our dinner that we did. Uh, we titled it Yule Feast, I think was a lot of fun. Uh, so we intend to do those types of dinners quarterly in the park. Um, we're really excited to work with Zena and, and uh, Fred. They have some great ideas, which I know is coming up next on the redesign for solving parks. So we're, we're excited to, you know, at least provide our input on from an event uh, and tourist standpoint on uh, those park designs. And uh, there's a couple of local events that I think have been dropped as a result of, of the changes over the last six months for which you know we've really not been involved, but uh, we're trying our best to make sure that there's no noticeable deficiency as a result of that. So uh, for example, Taste of Tourism is an event that has traditionally occurred I believe the third T taste week. of solving, right? Yeah. What did I say? Taste of tourism. Taste of tourism. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> taste. You, you guys make me nervous. Ta yeah. Taste of solving. It was. Uh, it's traditionally, as my understanding has, has occurred, the third weekend in March. Um, I think at this stage, it'll be really tough to pull something off at that scale. So, um, you know, we've had some initial conversations with uh, the, the the local chamber. Um, and with a couple of hoteliers here locally to see if we can do something to ensure that uh, any existing rooms are not uh, lost or any additional, uh, there's, no, uh, there's no pain felt from that. But uh, we want to bring something a little bit bigger and different um, to, to market in April, uh, you know, under maybe the moniker Taste of Solving. Maybe Taste of Tourism, that sounds good. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so additionally, we'll provide operations and logistics support to anybody who asks for it. Um, you know, we want to be a resource to everybody in the city. Um, you know, we fully believe that that all tide, you know, a, a big tide raises all boats. So, uh, you know, we have a giant warehouse full of televisions and uh, trusts and speakers and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, we want to make that available to folks here uh, so that, you know, they can do what they need to do without spending you know, tons of money. And if they want to spend tons of money, that's totally fine too. We can, we can politely back away. So um, that's the agreement that we put before you. I'm sure over the next few months, as we get the steering committee, uh, you know, up and running, uh, we'll have some, some recommendations for events moving forward. But I think this provides a pretty strong baseline to get us through the end of this fiscal year. Um, and will give us some momentum into the next fiscal year and, you know, gives folks a a good feeling that we're not just going to go into, you know, the next year the way that we went into the 2020. So that's what I have to say. Great. Are there any questions? Yes. From the council. I Did you say anything about data analytics and, and how that might fit into? Yeah. So we have some pretty strong KPIs for ourselves that we've established and, and data analytics are a big part of that. Uh, establishing what that those data sets look like. We have access to, uh, I know the city 
was looking at the credit card data. We own that data already, so I think we're excited to be able to introduce some of those synergies, and we'll be able to start showing uh, the result of our efforts over the next six months. So then you would incorporate the data analytics into event planning? Correct. Yeah, yeah, understanding the how the events are, you know, not every event needs to have a 100% ROI, right? Like there might be something that we just, is fun for people, maybe, right? Uh, but knowing that going into it is important and establishing that KPI early on. Uh, we're gonna do uh, Jenga in the solving park. Do we expect to make a single penny out of that? No. Do we expect locals to have something to do on a rainy Saturday? Yes. It's the KPI for that event. Locals having a good time on a rainy Saturday? Yes. Did they do it? Yes. Check. Done. Right? Um, <laughs> but if we have other events that, you know, especially part of this grant fund, um, establishing those KPIs and, and making sure that everybody's on the same page of what we're expecting from, from those grants, um, I think will benefit the entire city and the community, quite frankly. So we'll be able to prioritize events based on correct data analytic information. Okay. Correct. So our recommendations will be driven based on that. Of course, they're non-binding recommendations. The council's free to say, nope, we think that's crazy. We don't want it. But we think that this will be a more collaborative approach uh, so that by the time an event is brought to the to the uh, council for approval. It's been vetted by a steering committee that we think represents a good cross-section of... And, uh, and what about marketing and advertising and target marketing specifically? Yeah, so as I mentioned last week, uh, we're not obviously a DMO. We're not a destination marketing organization. We think that you have one in the Valley that's spending an awful lot of money advertising with uh, with Amtrak, advertising with, with tourists overseas. Um, we want to we want to work with them to, to capitalize on that, to feed content into that in, into what they're doing. They're spending plenty of money doing that. We'd like to, to help them do that. Um, what we want to do is create experiences and market those experiences, not just for ourselves, but for everything that's coming into solving. What, what I'm getting at is using things like social media mm -hmm. to and, and the, yeah, that, the credit card information, for example, to figure out who we want to bring to solving for different types of events. Yes. And then target marketing those zip codes. Can you do that? Yeah, I apologize. When I say digital marketing, I'm kind of encompassing all of that. But but targeting our, uh, we did a lot of targeting within Yule Fest. Um, uh, you know, we had a couple of, of uh, well-known billionaires that attended uh, as a result of our targeting a certain net worth category. And, I, you know, we have some strong data around our successes there. And we'll continue that through. With, I'd like with to see more of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I do have one last thing to say. I, I should have said it at the very beginning, and I apologize. Uh, the last time I was here, I did mention uh, that we that we had talked to that one of our disappointment. Sorry, let me start over again. One of the things I mentioned last week during the wrap up for Yule Fest was that we were disappointed that the folks who had done the candlelight tours were not uh, available for uh, Yule Fest this year, and we've received some emails about that after the event we did some research and that turned out to be a hundred percent a staffing error within our organization uh, that was an employee that made a mistake uh, that was not true those folks would have uh, uh, I mean I'm taking them at their word they've indicated that they would have been interested had they been contacted <coughs> uh, I was obviously told they were contacted by one of my employees and it turns out that that was patently false uh, so I would like to publicly apologize to those people for saying that they were not available. Um, that was information that I got from one of my employees and that employee has been dealt with. But, um, you know, I just want to make sure that that's public. I'm taking responsibility for that mistake. Thank you. Are there any questions of IDK? Okay, with that, we'll take this to public comment. Sorry, I did, I, since I didn't get to ask this last time, not to put too fine a point on it, but you were with us when I had that discussion, or when we had the discussion with uh, Theater Fest. Since you were there, can you address that? Uh, I, no. 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 Thank you. We're going to public comment. Thank you. Um, with that, I have no speaker slips on this item. Would anyone like to speak on this item? I see no one interested in speaking on this item. We'll take it back to the Council for Discussion and Action. I would like to start off by just, you know, pointing out that I think there's a few key things that, that Scott touched on. Number one is being a resource to everyone in this city. So, you know, whether it's uh, Danish days happening or, you know, whatever, you know, they can all work with IDK. Um, we can work through the steering committee to vet it through the community and come up with the best possible situations, um, best possible events. I think all that's great. 
Um, visitor Center, Brenda, you're doing a great job. You come here with ideas that you want to do with the Visitor Center, but I think that IDK can move you know, faster and help you with accomplishing some of those goals with the Visitor Center, so that's my two cents there. Um, and then you know, not duplicating expenses. You know, Visit SYVs, you know, sp you know, they have nearly a million dollar a year budget marketing the Valley. You know, we're the heart of the Valley. Let's give Visit SYV some experiences that they can, they can market here. So. Um, again, thank you very much, Scott, and, and great job for everything. So those are my quick two cents. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to discuss this item? My only points are that um, whenever I hear events for locals, I cringe now because the angriest emails we get are, was when, are when we do events for locals. And it really, really, really upsets a small group of people. So it's just a matter of everything we do, we need to s somehow balance the needs for the locals as well as the needs for the tourists. People think we're debasing Solvang. Um, some of the adjectives or the, the phrases that they've used, it just it makes me sad. Um, but I think it is important uh, that we do not lose our brand. Um, that's one of the things that I do agree with on the some of the emails that I've seen. But yet I also get real excited when we do fun things for the locals. So. There's just that balance. And just like anything, even in the business community, an event doesn't, it doesn't take care of every type of business the same way it takes. You know, so we can no just event, try and do what helps, yeah. No events for everyone is an important thing to remember. And then, of course, we went through a situation where you had, we had to move fast or what, you know, cancel Christmas. So we chose not to cancel Christmas, you know. So those are just things where, of course, it's going to be criticized and, and, you know, this could have been done better. Yeah, well, with a year of planning, next year will be better. We did what we could with, you know, what, eight weeks. Chris or Daniel or? I just Aaron? have one, one question about the contract, uh, I guess, of staff. It just, it says down here, Reimbursable expenses, visitor center staff. I'm just wondering what that entails. Is that not included in the contract of the 300,000, or is that? So, so the visitor center would be more of a pass through, and that would still, uh, I don't know, okay, Scott, Scott. if you're better answering this, but that would still be something for um, to be worked out with the visitor center. Yeah, so I put that in there as an option, and that's 100% up to, to the current visitor center. If the visitor center wants to come and work with us, then that gives – we don't then have to come back and open this whole thing up again and continue. So it's an optional piece of the contract that you can choose to do. If they choose not to, they already have a contract with you. That contract doesn't end. We have nothing to do with it. We have no dog in that fight. We're super happy to continue as two separate entities. We have absolutely no problem with that. If the visitor center decides that they want – uh, for, for whatever reason, if there's some synergies that they want to take advantage of um, and we decide that it makes sense as well, then we didn't want to have to come back and reopen this process. So we put that in as an optional pass-through expense. So it would be, uh, it's an expense that you've already uh, budgeted for in a separate line item. Right. Uh, so we wouldn't touch it. We do think that there would be some savings there. We would be able to cut that number down a little bit um, because obviously we need to be paying for separate liability insurance, separate internet, phone lines, workers' comp, Correct. blah, 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 so, blah. So it's basically already negotiating the contract that you take over the management of that if that were to happen you're not going to then come to us and say oh now we want you know if the visitor center chooses to work under correct advocate. but i want to make sure that i'm crystal clear there that we're not that we're not advocating for that it's not something that we're right. aggressively pursuing it's 100 percent up to the current management there which is an option yeah but you're not going to come back and ask us for more money correct thank you hey i have a final comment um I just want to make sure that we have um, set policy for uh, direct line reporting to our acting city manager. Thank you. This, that, that was one of my, my big concerns was I don't want to have the council micromanaging IDK. I want it to go through our, our manager and then come through us. Thank you. So this is all about trying to get this off of this desk. Yay. So. One other question on the steering committee, is that something that's, how's that going to be decided or um, who's going to come up with who's on that committee? Uh, is 16 people, on, so I think it, it said 16 people. Is, is that it appropriate that IDK will come people. up with recommendations and, and bring that back to the council or how, how are we? Right, I mean. It might in, be a big deal is all I'm in, saying. In discussions, preliminary discussions with IDK, the idea was that IDK would come up with the recommendations at this committee. It's a non-binding committee, so frankly it can be changed at any point, but it's really something that IDK would work with the community to set up for us. Yeah, I don't want okay. To. <laughs> okay. 
I'll move that we approve the contract with IDK through June 30th, 2020. I'll second that. It's been seconded. M Member Tim Clark? Yes. Council Member Diarnes? Yes. Council Member Johnson? Yes. Council Member Waite? Yes. Mayor Toussaint? Yes. That motion carries 5 0. Thank you. On title number five, can I get a title read on the staff report? Item number five, Mayor and Council, is the Solvent Park request for proposals. Staff recommends that the City Council provide direction for consideration for Solvent Park regeneration projects. City Manager will make brief remarks, followed by the Parks Director. So, yes, uh, this item is to begin and get some policy direction from the council on the Solving Park. As you know, we've had quite a few events at the Solving Park, and there's been previous discussions on, you know, the city council indicated uh, to us last summer the, the desire to spruce Sol Solving Park can be better used ongoing, can be better used for events. So this item is really looking for council direction as to how would you like to proceed with the Solving Park forward. So what we've done is put together three diagrams that kind of outline different scenarios for, you know, the smaller version, the cheaper version for uh, spursing up Solving Park, the medium version, and then the most expensive one. What we're really looking for you at this point, and then we can work with IDK as far as, you know, the events are concerned, but also with uh, the community and maybe the steering committee uh, to make sure that we meet everybody's uh, desires and needs in the park, including our businesses, our tourists, and our residents, because it's really a park for all of them. But what we're looking for today from you is, Fred is going to present the three options and getting direction from you as to what is the magnitude of budget that you're looking for investing into, and what is the look and feel uh, that you would like to see from the Solving Park. So Fred is going to go through that. Um, based on that direction, we'll take that direction from you. We'll develop a more precise RFP to go out for proposals, work with IDK, work with them and the committee, um, and go forth with one of the options based on the direction today. So I'll turn it over to Fred. Uh, good evening, Council, and thank you to Zina. Uh, she realizes I'm coming off my first full bout of laryngitis. So if my voice is in and out, I apologize. Um, so we have three plans here for you tonight, plan A, B, and C. And generally speaking, the ideas were pieces that I heard from the council retreat last summer, as well as trying to preserve some of the ideas in reality, because I had other ones that I did not propose here that were just far-flung ideas during our executive retreat that we just started throwing out ideas. But plan A here um, deals with the least expensive option. And you can see there are four basic things we do. Completely resod the park, paint the two primary structures, the bandstand and the gazebo, excuse the gazebo, which is the bandstand, and the restroom. And then um, because there have been some comments, and by some I mean only a few to me directly, about the deck that is currently there, that it could potentially be a hazard, would be the removal of that, increase the hardscape, and put some benches down. So that would be a fairly low-cost option. Do you have an estimate <coughs> on that one, just to range? I do not have accurate estimates on any of them. Uh, these are just proposals, but we have not sought out any type of estimate. Right. And that will, be, that will also include the removal of those tree stems? Yes, it would. So I would say that this one is about 100000 or lower than that. But this is a yeah, lower option. Definitely, definitely lower than 100000 would you say 50? Well, the sod alone, we just had priced out just for the bark area at about $8,000. So if you did the whole thing, let's say four times that, so 30 to 40K. We had a quote for the restroom, probably a five, six year old quote at just under five. Even if that were double, that'd be 10. That puts us at a high right now of 50. Remove and concrete. Yeah, you could probably get it for 70, 75 guessing okay and plan B incorporates the same first four things but as you see there in the upper corner on number two we have moved the HCA bust which is currently um, at the location of the tree in between number four and number five I'm sure you're aware of where it is now 
So it would provide more of an inviting entrance into the park, something to come walk towards, and then that would walk towards the Christmas tree planter, and a European-style piazza would be built around that. And then number three down in the corner by the bandstand is just an increased amount of hardscape. And number four is additional hardscape in front of the restroom. And that area is, generally speaking, where the Danish Days Lego tent is. So it doesn't really get used for anything other. Okay, thank you. Um, and as far as costs here, You don't have to give us a cost. Yeah, I mean, 150, 200K, since I'm a professional estimator. I, I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? I'm could be one not being a professional just, estimator between 150 and 200K. Okay. Just so we understand the tiers that were. I, I got Matt back there. I just heard him say about right. So we'll say 167, 542. Yeah. Yeah. So that, Euro that. that European piazza is pretty expensive, what you're telling me. Well, that could be a number of things. When I I'm had. I'm kidding. It's okay. Okay, but, but to that point, actually, when we had originally talked about that, it could be anything from the aggregate concrete that is there to stonework to all brick to right. stamped concrete, so it could certainly range. Okay. And then Plan C, uh, this gets certainly more bold, and some of you may be aware of this because this was originally the first design idea I had started drawing with after the, um, the council retreat that I had proposed to the former city manager. So he may have shared some of this information with you, I'm not certain. But number one is key. That was relocating the Christmas tree planter to the northeast. And we actually went out and painted the lines of where all the new locations would be to create number three, which is that additional walkway. Um, and then, of course, number 11, down below, you'll see the bandstand is gone. And you can see a hint of a yellow rectangle underneath. That is basically the area that's behind the barn currently in the park, um, which has never grown grass well because of the constant shade of underneath the deodor tree. And there was talk of putting some type of little a kid's play area that would obviously be cordoned off and for safety issues, et cetera. But there has always been and seemingly a request from tourists, not so much the locals, but from tourists we occasionally hear, where can mom or dad entertain the kid where, while the other mom or dad is off shopping? So instead of pulling the three-year-old all the way around, one of the parents can sit down with them there. And then number five and six would be the grandiose cost, um, and that would be to relocate the bandstand to the west end which does provide kind of an amphitheater effect. So you'd be sitting down in a large grass area. The only issue with that, of course, is you're looking directly into the sun. So that would be a potential issue, unless, of course, you somehow created a large backdrop. Uh, so anyways, uh, of course, a number eight increased the seating area underneath some type of advanced pergola, whether it be fabric, wood, metal, et cetera. So, so those are why, just why would you relocate the bandstand? Why not just build a new one? Wouldn't that be cheaper? You absolutely could build a bandstand in its current location. The concept of moving it over is adding the, per, the amphitheater style, so everybody's staring one way. In the current area, um, based on which event is held, um, public, private, whether it's even through Parks and Rec, the direction that you use that bandstand changes. For movies in the park, we show the screen to the west. You have concerts going directly out towards the tree planter. Um, the two large sycamores, which are certainly not going to be moved, bisect that grass area. And with this design, the number three, that walkway kind of, you have two zones, if you will. The Christmas tree planter with plenty of seating, walking area, etc., and then a bandstand down on the other end entertaining just the people on the grass and the surrounding benches. So how do you fit more people into the, the area? With the, this manner, this method, or leaving the bandstand where it is now? Well, where the bandstand is now, the only difficult problem is 
you don't have the same amount of seeding because of the Christmas tree planter and the two sycamores provide a visual blockage, if you will. Right. But the park is so small, we're talking a minimal amount of difference. All right. So, but those three are just thrown out there for you guys to start discussing. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Otherwise... And I'm just a curiosity, what would it cost to build a new bandstand as opposed to... That I'm for, for really have no for idea. For Plan C, just rough... Yeah, you know, is this now above three hundred thousand? Oh, I would yes. certainly Probably imagine half a million. It's more thing. like a six fifty. Yeah, it's yeah, okay. a half million plus. Okay, so this is in the six fifty area. You know, moving the tree scares the heck out of me because I want to see it rooted in here for. It a was while. one of the discussions we had with the tree, the group that planted the tree, Bent and them and John, yeah. all saw this plan before that tree was in. Mm -hmm. Why didn't they just move it like you said? Well, they said they could, didn't they? I mean, they said well, the I mean, decision before. was if, you know, if the council were to move on this sooner back, you know, yeah. then the plan would be that you would leave the tree in its uh, bag and then m relocate it right after Yule Fest to where the determined permanent location would be. That did not happen. So you would be re uprooting the tree and you'd, ha you'd have a higher risk of losing the tree then, which I personally don't want to do. Um, <clears throat> are there any other questions of the staff report? No. Okay. No other questions? Well, actually, there is one other question, and, th and this has to do with um, including lot number two into some type of, like, almost like a, an adjunct or expansion to the park so that when we have events, it's a natural, you know, transition as you move from the park to lot number two for additional um, event. I have drawn up several plans for parking lot number two to be completely converted, but they were not included in this report. So it is definitely something that we can work through. I think lot number two, you know, is a little bit bigger scope now, and I think that probably needs to align with work with both Cosmont and economic development on the work on parking and then the work with IDK. So I think that can definitely be added. And the question here is really, do you want us to start moving <coughs> with something now with just the park? And obviously lot number two can be developed and added later if there is that direction. But right now, is there a desire on the council to move forward with either you know, a smaller remodel, a medium remodel, <coughs> or you know, the big you know, create your European style more of that type of feel, big remodel of the park. Okay. Are there any questions of the staff report? Yes. Um, questions of staff report. This is a question. Yes. Um, why isn't the pergola option in all of the options? Because I remember going through the park and discussing putting the pergola a year ago. Putting the per pergola. Oh, yeah, what Karen's what? talking oh, about yes, is yes. where the trees were taken out. Um, that could certainly be an option going forward. Um, obviously, when the three of us met to discuss that, that kind of became a smaller issue and just right. put aside, if you will, while the bigger plans started taking place. So all those quotes that I had for those um, permanent shades in location of the tree trunks, I still have. Of course, this, at this point, they're dated. Okay, thank you. Can you come up with a, an estimate, almost like a modular estimate, where you say, "This is what it would cost with the pergolas. This is what it would cost, you know, with a brand new bandstand, or this would be a cost of moving the the current um, band. Ha what do you call it? And then mix and match. Yeah, so it's almost like Legos. You can all, snap all it in and say, "This costs." Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we would just that's just itemizing. Yeah, exactly. Everything. So I mean, but sense. once you guys determine right. what pieces you want. That's, I mean, if you select five pieces versus 27 pieces, there's right. little reason for me to go out and itemize 27 if exactly. you're going to pick five. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that might be useful. All right. Uh, so if there's no more c questions of the staff report, um, I'll go, we'll go to public comment. I have no speaker slips Thank on this you, item. Thank you, Fred. Is there anyone that would like to speak on this item? I see no one. I see one oh, person. Yeah. Which, I just want an artificial no, I, I'm sorry, but I need, if you're going to speak, you've got to come to the microphone. And get on TV. Um, <laughs> I just think that uh, 
artificial do, do you mind? Do you mind just stating your name? Mm, Hi, my name is Just Candy trying to follow the, the process here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi to the council, et cetera. Um, I live in the village collection, so I'm very interested in Lot 72, which is why I'm attending these days. Um, but I really think that a good quality artificial grass is going to hold up better. I don't like the look of it, but it doesn't wear out and it works in shade and all of that. It is expensive, the first go, but it has its value ultimately. And it stays green instead of brown. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, with that, we'll take this back to the council for discussion action. Okay. Um, I really like, uh, at this point in time, option two, but I would go ahead and do, you know, some add-ons like the pergola and the benches around the European-style piazza, because I like the idea of having benches around that. You mean B? Yeah, I, I, yeah, Plan B. Okay, yeah, Plan B. Um, with the, but but also putting the pergolas in. I think it would it would make the the park it would definitely be in a an improvement and it wouldn't be um, a full reconstruction of a new uh, amphitheater or gazebo because I know that we have other pending expenses that um, kind of uh, take importance over the reconstruction and redevelopment of this park. Yeah. So those are some of my same concerns is, is we have a lot of other costs that we have to take care of but then I think also with some of the new direction on some of the events that we're having and, and watching the wear and tear on the park as quick as they were, partially due to the success of the events, um, I had on my list, you know, there's um, uh, one was I, I did like some of the wash lights that were uh, in the park, but I have a question around, you know, could we have permanent well lights that are down the ground that aren't getting, you know, stolen? Or can we have boxes around the trees that how that could be dual purpose like, you know, seating for people to sit out there and enjoy the park on, you know, under the, under the tree, um, but also house the, the well lights within it. Or like, for example, we have this uh, barn that's now um, in, the, in the park and it might not be the most aesthetically fitting thing that's there, but I kind of like the idea around having a barn in the park where when you have music in the park or you have other things going on, you know, you could allow different vendors to rotate with serving coffee or hot chocolate or cookies or, you know, things like that out of the, out of the barn there. We might be able to utilize leaving it there, but finding a way to make it fit there. And um, get prettier. Yeah. And then uh, another is, I think we still have an ADA issue with uh, number six there on the, on the item, I, I believe that Vikings was working on raising some money to uh, put a ramp there, so that might be something. But they are out now. They're out, okay. So, but that might be something that we look at, you know, just in some temporary type fixes. But, um, and my last item on my list was, I have a little bit of a hard time just resodding the park, especially when I hear of the surface area of the estimated cost in here was around eight eight thousand or so for that smaller area and then you want to multiply it by four or so to calculate doing the whole park but if, if if you have another event there that just sits there and tears up all that grass we now see that you know the soil is very like it's it's clay the water is not just percolating down it kind of sits there and creates a problem and then now we're dumping bark out there in the park to try to um you know make it safe um, is there a more permanent or better solution there around that? Is it is it artificial turf? Is does it do we need French drains? Do we need you know what do we need to do to kind of solve some of these issues around here? Um, I I'm I'm more apt to spending less money and just taking care of the park in the meantime while we let other events settle in and let IDK um, you know they might have some really good feedback into how to make this more suitable for activities that are going on in the park. Um, today, but I'd hate to all of a sudden, you know, spend half million plus on a, a full revamp of the park and and not really have it fully vetted. Fred, if, if you have any... Yeah, if I may, certainly. Um, certainly, sod would be one of the least costs, so it could be a sacrificial cost, if you will, if we move forward immediately with putting grass in, 
while this takes however long it takes, six months, 12 months, 24 months before we actually decide and get the money and dedicate the money, et cetera. Um, however, a lot of other options have been proposed. Increasing hardscape, DG, artificial turf has been proposed. Um, I can tell you that uh, the best man for my wedding works for a professional organization who does sod all over the planet, and he recommends against it just based on its size. I don't have details as to why, but he does Georgia Dome um, stadiums in Australia, and so he recommends against it, so that's one professional in the area. I'm sorry, against sod against or against what? Against artificial, uh, artificial turf, turf. Artificial turf. for okay. a number of variety of reasons. Okay. And what about um, but you will notice in every one of these designs behind the um, line item that says install new sod, it says grading changes with a question mark because right now we're below sidewalk level. So the water pools. Um, it used to not be so low. I mean, we have pictures from the park several years ago where it almost, certainly not from a ground level, but it appears as though the surface was a little taller and certainly I see pooling in the park differently every few years, depending upon the amount of events and where that foot traffic was. Obviously this last year was exceptional as far as foot traffic with the recurring events. Usually the park has time to kind of recover in between. I mean, it's always bad after Danish days, it's always bad after Yule Fest, but there's been no downtime this last season. Mm -hmm. What about more durable turf? like? St. Augustine grass or something like that. Certainly, if we if you elected to go with sod, we'd be looking into the hardest, toughest sod we could put down. And then what about uh, changing the clay material underneath it? Because, like you said, it becomes a slippery mess. Absolutely. Yeah. I hate, I have to ask this because. What about this this tree where number three is? There's this weird pine tree. I don't know what it's called, but it's a certain type of tree, right? The it's, big deodor? That's it. Deodor. A deodor. Why is that there? Because someone planted it a while ago. <laughs> I don't know exactly, but it's well past. I've been here 24 years, and it was well established by the time I got here. Probably a volunteer. Might be. Deodors are good, in the, good at that. Wow. Yes. Did you, I'm sorry, I, one last question. What about making sure that, I'm looking at the trees that we have, the sycamore trees, and I know that one of them, for example, where number two is, it looks like it's dead. And I'd um, like- That would be a street tree if that's by area it, number it's two. It's a street tree and it's on the corner and it does look like it's struggling. So what I'm suggesting is, is there a way to tra tra um, change out the trees over time and, and plant them with something that it's much more attractive and provides more shade? For example, maybe, um, Oh, gosh. Those are sycamores. No, I'm thinking of the one that makes flowers, jacarandas. Yeah, they are messy, but they're also really beautiful when they all bloom at the same time. So um, they provide great shade. Well, we, I just actually, to kind of limit what you say before I try to answer, um, about two months ago I became in charge of street trees, so I'm learning as we go. I don't even know the street trees as far as the list of availables. I don't know if jacarandas on that list or not. Street trees have changed from time to time, but I know what the past councils have asked for and Public Works, who was dealing with street trees, wanted was consistency down the blocks. Oh, I agree. So not an olive, then a sycamore, then a jacaranda, and then something else. And I agree with that. I'm just getting at the idea that as these trees get old and start to die off, do we have a plan to replace them with something that may be more, more better suited for what we want? Um, there's nothing more beautiful than jacarandas when they're in full bloom. They are messy, but they're incredible, and they provide a tremendous amount of shade. I think what Chris is trying to ask is this, is there a more desirable tree in the long run to switch to? I think sycamores are pretty popular for a fast-growing you know, tree that they throw into lots of different developments because it pops up and provides that shade tree quicker than a lot of other trees grow. But is there a more permanent type, maybe evergreen or something else that, that goes there? The Sycamores are more prone to, you know, it's a deciduous tree and then it's more prone to mold on the leaves and dropping, which increases people's allergies and things like that. Really does, right? Is that the best tree that we want throughout the city? That's well, well, being new to the street trees, I actually don't have an answer for you. Okay. You're not all knowing? Mm -hmm. I mean, Matt may know something more than I because he was involved and he could speak to it if so, but I don't have an answer. Yeah. We actually, there is an approved tree list here. Correct. That we have. 
And so maybe maybe someone can follow up with the approved tree list with Chris and talk to him about that. Well, I would just like to see landscaping be part of the, the, the ultimate decision. Some of the, the, the cities are famous because of the landscaping they choose. Um, this is a very, for example, if you look at the, the English tradition in, in English cities, um, they're well known for their botanical gardens, if you will. I'd like to see something like that if we can incorporate it. I think I would suggest that if that's of interest, we could incorporate, you know, the review of our tree program as part of the financial plan development or even mm -hmm. economic development potentially. I mean, there, <laughs> there's beautiful trees and there's also the maintenance of the trees and the Water. impacts they have on drainage, et cetera. Right. Sure. I appreciate that. that. Right. Uh, Matt, if you want to if you want to speak on the item, you can come up here and speak on it. Otherwise, I, from the floor, it's not the best. So uh, I don't believe there's any limitations on tree types of trees or whatever you want to do for the city parks. So it's totally wide open. Uh, the street trees are listed uh, limited to a list of recommended trees that. Um, have roots that go down and don't uplift the sidewalk and cause trip and fall claims and hazards. Uh, so s street trees are totally different from, you know, what you're talking about here. You, you can just move the tree a little. If you replace a tree, you can plant it a few feet back. It's out of the public right of way. It's got plenty of room. It's in the park. You can basically do whatever you want. But I would recommend getting some advice from a yeah. landscape architect. Or whatever. An example, that would be sycamores. They're great at uplifting everything. Yeah, and you're right. They grow fast. They go into the sewer. They, they, they you know, like we just finished the project that the, uh, the Legion Wing of Betts Hall um, replacing all the sewer because the sycamore trees just find the water and just, yeah. just destroy the Take sewer off. line. Yeah, so. Perfect. Uh, so with that, does the council have any direction that, that we can give staff here. I'm, I'm more apt to, if, you know, things are changing, reviewing other things. I'd rather just, you know, f do whatever we can do to fix up the park in the most cost effective manner, especially with all the other costs that we have ahead of us. Uh, can I add something? But yeah, please. I, I do like very, very much the, the European style piazza around the Christmas tree planter. I like very much moving the Hans Christian Andersen statue in a more prominent place as number two and then connecting those maybe with hardscape. And then if we, I, personally, I would just like to just do something with the gazebo to, to make it more appealing and, and more um, user-friendly for events and bands, et cetera. Um, I mean, I love the idea of having an actual concert stage and an amphitheater. Maybe that could kind of cut into what the Theater Fest could do as well, though. But I think it would be a more inviting place if the, if the gazebo. So those are my, my number six, number one, and number two are my three biggest issues on, the, um, on Plan B, which I like. And I do think it would be kind of neat to have a kid's area there if that can be done economically. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. So, so maybe one of the things we do is kind of, you know, get a cost for more of option number one with some add-on items that the council's um, expressed interest in tonight and see where we're at. Yeah, no, I, th I, I, I really like Robert's ideas there. Um, I'd, I really would like to get a cost on the um, pergola add-ons. Um, and then I just am wondering if anyone has given possibility to not having grass over that entire area, but have just sections of grass, and then you could hardscape um, more of it, and it would be... Like cobblestone in some areas. Or, or D, just D, DG, just in, so there wouldn't be as much grass there, um, so you wouldn't have to worry about replacing that and you know watering it or, or whatnot. So yeah. just a little I, more. I, I definitely that was one of my concerns. I'd be very open to exploring any ideas around more sustainable type solutions. Well, that's why I like the idea of Plan C, where you move the whole gazebo or the band stand to the other side, and then perhaps put DG or something that's more durable over there. And that way, the, that side of the park, the, the east side, can have that the grass. I think it would be, it would probably do okay over there, according to Fred. Um, I think it might be useful for Fred to come back to us with um, component costs, like the the cost of moving 
the bust or the cost of putting a piazza because there's multiple types of piazza. Like you, you can use different kinds of stone or brickwork, the cost of the pergola. So in other words, I love what, the direction that you're giving us, but I'd like to see a little more detail so we can decide what makes the most sense. And I love what uh, Mayor Toussaint's suggesting, which is we're not even sure which direction we want to go in with respect to um, event, different kinds of events. Maybe this isn't the best place to have lots of foot traffic, right? Maybe we need a different place. Um, so if, if that's the case, then we would change the type of plan that we'd go with. Maybe we'd go with plan A because it's inexpensive and easy to maintain. So I, I'd like to see more detail. I think we're going to spend a half a million to uh, $600,000, $700,000. We should be looking at a 3D rendering of a park that's all redone. I mean, in this day and age, I see no reason well, to spend this. This is more money. direction for an RFP. I get so, it. Yeah. So, so I think in the short run, what we're looking at is adding some hardscape and, um, you know, obviously making, bringing back the grass so it actually looks halfway decent. Um, if you add some hardscape, you get rid of some of that grass problem. But in the short run, I think that's what we do. I think the, the park really needs a completely revamp. And uh, well, it, it begs I don't the question, spend how, how do we want to use dollars. the park? Do we want to have it for musical events and more active? For example, every month we have a new event, or is that just too much on the grass? I think that's what's going to happen when IDK gets together with its group and starts talking right. about the direction of the city right. and all that. So right now, we just got to say, bring back one and two with some components and we can look at what the costs are and then we go from there. Right, and we would work with IDK even on the options one and two and get their recommendation as far as, you know, how do we maximize this for... Because they're going to have a lot venue. of other recommendations around how to format the park, how to, you know, the stage, where the location should mean, anything like that. I would tailor to, tailored to you know, the use of, the intended use of the, par the, the park. I mean, just look at the changes that are happening now. You have Jenga out there on the weekends. You have, you know... So there's things that are just different. And let them come back with some feedback into it. But I'm just more apt into just spending, you know, being as conservative as possible with yeah. with the current um, spending. So I'm hearing that maybe work with IDK to develop an RFP that would really be uh, itemized type of a proposal, and we can come back with more detail and more precise cost and more right. detail on how this all blends with the events and right. what are the best materials. Right. Yeah. We'd encourage sustainability in terms of not having to replace grass every time there's, you know. Or things so like we it, can issue that RFP being, you right. know, itemized as and, such. And can we break, can we actually ask you guys to include how to best use lot number two for events or is that for a different d uh, agenda? I would like to have a little bit more correlation there with the work that's being done by, with a parking study with uh, right. Cosmont and then also of course with IDK. But I think it's definitely a, a primary in the middle of the city right. and the question would be how would you like to really best utilize it going forward? Yeah, I mean, is that, so do you want direction on that or do you want no. to take some time, come back? I think we're take looking at time, a band-aid right now and yeah. then that's more of, overall the, the plan of the city you know you're talking you know your whole district well I, i'm bringing it up only because whatever we do with lot number two is going to take a lot of time in the meantime why not make some minimal adjustments to it or improvements so that it can be an extension of whatever event so i, I think that's there. what daniel's saying is it, well, i think that's what we're all saying is the band-aid to get through that yeah and i think a really good start would be one and two and six yeah well i think it should also include discussion about lot number two and how that fits in Possibly, I, I do agree with Chris. Possibly, the access between the two in the short run can be looked at. I don't know if that's right. maybe more accessible. Well, I, I think that could be easily, you know, yeah. involved with as we right. start to work with IDK right. about on the logistics of how do we hold events that access that use of right. parking lot number two without actually reconstructing it. Exactly could be a part of that work and we'll come back with recommendations with IDK. Yeah, I mean, for example, maybe it's a simple, I'd like to see more lights in the parking lot um, that can be utilized during events as well as some power, uh, un, you know, underground power so that people can access it if they're going to put uh, little um, food vendors and things like this. I, I think that we didn't give it enough forethought or the past council didn't give enough forethought when they did all that work on that parking lot number two. It could have been done a little differently. And make it all day. Is that enough direction? I, I don't think we need I a motion on this. I believe that is enough direction. There is okay. no need for a motion. Thank you. 
On to item number six. Can I get a title readout and staff Thank report? Thank you, Mayor. Item number six is the Hans Christian Anderson Tennis Courts Contract Award. City Manager will present. I'm Go actually, ahead. I'm going to turn it over to Fred shortly here, but uh, the reason we are here today is because uh, the rec final recommendation is for the council to approve that we move forward to for negotiation with an original bidder from a couple of years ago that was the lowest bid. There was just a technical issue with the license, which, wa which is why the bid was originally rejected. That has been fixed, and the original bidder is still available. As staff, we cannot um, go into negotiations and award the contract without the bidding process, but it is within the council purview. So since there's actually been two RFPs issued, uh, it would be definitely within the Council's discretion to approve us to go forward with that. And I will let Fred give us a little bit more history on the tennis courts. Yeah, um, Zena was spot on right there. The only difference, or the only thing I would add was the first time we went to bid, I think I brought that back to this Council, we had four bids and with a quite a discrepancy from 212 up to about $650,000. Um, so the licensure issue caused us to reject those bids. We then went out again to bid with a formal RFP, um, received two bids. The low bidder at that time had a bid of 222000 which was about 150 less than his original bid. Though we sent out the exact same scope of work, he claimed that this current bid was only for two courts. So he, in all, for all intents and purposes, backed out. Then we went to Gordon, which you'll see in your staff report. Uh, that actually started with the interim city manager, and I'm drawing a blank, the one up from Santa Maria. Rick Hayden. Rick. And so we met with him. We've met with them again with David Gassaway, again with Zena, and we finally moved forward um, and used them to find a contractor for us and get bids back. And those are in your packet, and you can see they range from 245 up to 790. 790 being for the same project that was originally the low bidders the first time around, the post-tension concretes. So although we do have a secondary option here now of the Plexa Premier, which as of this morning that cost has gone up to closer to about 300 k for a little bit better product, so that is another possible solution, but that doesn't um, fix the subsurface problem. Although they suggest it could last longer, anywhere between 5 and 10, anywhere between 5 and 20 years, they're not guaranteeing anything longer than five. And the original um, bidder from 2018, November, uh, first serve tennis courts, is interested in giving us a new price. And we have $283,000 already donated for this project and another 10 coming in. So it's a total of 293 that has been donated to complete this project. So the reason we're bringing it to council today is instead of taking more time and going up for bid again. We actually have a bidder that's within the budget that has the scope of work that the city was originally interested in, still willing to negotiate. So as long as we can negotiate something within that budget, the recommendation is to just go ahead and go with that vendor. And what's the expect, I'm sorry, I, I got a little lost in the different um, materials and uh, options that we have here. And then the the scope here of price ranges from 245,000 to <coughs> almost 800,000 just kind of is crazy. Um, but uh, what's the <coughs> difference in terms of lifespan on, on each proposal? The post-tension concrete courts in this proposal being the 790 and originally being the first bidder first serve at 212,000 is the exact same courts that you have at Los Olivos School and the high school. So those that, that's a five to seven inch build on on top of, and I've heard lifespans up to 50 years plus. And you're saying that the current bidder within the, around the $300,000 range is going to do that? No. Different system. Yeah, the, the $300,000 you see there is from Gordian. Number four, the Plexa Premier at 245. Okay. That price went up this morning with a thicker system, a better system, and it's now estimated around 300. What Zena and I are suggesting is that we go back to first serve tennis courts, the very first bidder from November of 2018. We've asked if they're interested in still in the project. They said yes. So we would just have to get a new price from them. 
We expect the 212 to go up, but still fall under the 283. So, but you're not talking about some weird material. Play. I mean, it's going to feel like a tennis court at the high school, right? I mean, I'm sorry. It's going to feel like a tennis court at the high school. I just want to make sure we're not putting something down there that's super cheap. No, the high school. If we go post tension, that's concrete. Okay. So what's going to what's going to be the difference then? I mean, what's the material difference? Why is it of the new tennis court? What's the uh, difference between that one and the one you're going to put in? Well, the one we have now is asphalt, and the subsurface is terrible. The one we'll be putting in is concrete reinforced, um, post tension. So you got the grid idea. Uh, that's a typical so tennis court. High school court plays well. Los Olivos court plays well. They're fairly indestructible. Okay. All right. I'm I'm still a little confused because you're saying that the, the one that you're recommending is about two, just say two fifty, and it's within the three hundred thousand that we're looking at, right? But this morning you had another bid for three hundred thousand for a no. different system. Different system. Is it better than Which, the one that we're looking at? No, it's, no, it's worse. It's not a full remodel. It's just uh, so basically. Yeah, it, it's a good fix, but it has no type of guarantee because we're okay. The Plexa Premier is basically more. a no. Yes. Okay, then forget it. It's, we'll go. Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. can I try and and suggest a motion? Because what you have is, I think you have a proposal. That you reject all of the all of the bids that you've received so far, and go back to a negotiated contract yeah, with an original bidder who will provide you with the high school court type material within the two hundred and eighty three thousand dollars you have available from a donation, and you could make what I just suggested right now in the form of a motion. Perfect. So, and I was just trying to just get to the bottom of the material and the lifespan of it, because it just comes down to those things. Do you spend two hundred fifty thousand on something that's going to last five years, or we spend more money on something that's going to last, you know, longer? So, if that's been suffice, then I'm, that's really all I was trying to get to the bottom of. It. Mr. Mayor, as I understand, the proposal is to negotiate within the two hundred eighty-three thousand dollar budget for material, which is is the same as what is at the high school. I think okay. it's two ninety-three. So, with that. Um, I think we still need to go to public comment. I think we got yes, a little lost in the questions there. Um, so I'll take this to public comment. I have no speaker slips on this item. Is there anyone who would like to comment on this item? Say none. I'll take this back to the council for discussion action. I'm fine with the suggested motion of uh, City Attorney Chip Wolbrandt. I will move that. I'll second it. It's been seconded. Council Member, uh, Member Tim Clark? Yes. Council Member Diarnes? Yes. Council Member Johnson? Yes. Council Member Waite? Yes. Mayor Chusson? Yes. That motion carries 5 0, Mayor. Thank you. So, no players. Thank you. On to. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes. If I may ask for um, clarification from Council Member Waite, when you said to bring back the pergolas, were those the ones that we were talking about next uh, to the deck? I or? think that is not, not on. We're so past I, that item. We're past that item. We okay. can do a motion Fair to reconsider, enough. and I can take your thing, or you can talk to Karen Waite after the meeting. Looks like you're going to talk to Karen Wade after the meeting. <laughs> Item number eight. Can I get a title readout and staff report? Which was skip number seven, Mayor? Seven. seven. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Item number seven. Item number seven, Mayor, members of the council, is the award of construction agreement for Sunnyfields Park Playground Repair Project, Public Works Project number 147. Alrighty, so uh, as I'm sure the City Council is aware, um, we had an inspection done of the Sunnyfields Park, all of various facilities uh, in the park that was done a while back, and um, it was identified that significant repairs were needed for the um, playground structure. And because of this uh, sort of unusual scope of work to do the repairs on that, the um, Public Works Department assisted the planning department in putting together a what we call a project manual, which is basically the plans and specifications, the bidding documents uh, to put that uh, project out to bid. So we created a bid schedule and the specifications, put it out to bid. We received three bids. Uh, the, bid, the bid spread is shown in the staff report, which is actually um, typical of what we see. Uh, one bid was um, below the engineer's quite a bit below the engineer's estimate. The other one, another bid was really close to the engineer's estimate, and another one was was uh, fairly uh, quite a bit higher than the engineer's estimate. So it's a good good spread, and um, again, uh, 
what, what we'd expect to see. And um, typically this type of th uh, staff report is just on the consent agenda for the city council's approval. It's fairly routine. Um, but I think there was a desire to possibly have some discussion, so it was put on the regular agenda. Uh, but staff does recommend that the city council proceed toward a construction agreement with Cal State contractors uh, in the amount of 89500 and authorize ex execution of the agreement by the mayor and also authorize the city manager to, to execute any change orders if within a contingency amount of $10,000. So that um, concludes my staff report. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Are there any questions on the staff report? Um, there doesn't seem to be a large difference between the number one and number two, and I just noticed that the obviously number two is a local, a local company. Um, I didn't know if for the extra ten thousand dollars, hiring a local company might be that they would do a better job, have more quality because they're local. Um, did that? Uh, sure, that's think a, about that. that, or? that that's an excellent question, and maybe um, as a relatively new council member, you're not aware, but. Um, the, the city council established a local bidder preference, and uh, that um, uh, is identified, was identified in the project manual, in the bid documents. Okay. And so that gives a 5% um, uh, adjustment to any local, local bidder. So basically the way it works is you'll have the low bid, and if the number two bidder is a local company, and they're within 5%, right. the city council can award the contract to that number two bidder, uh, but in this case, the um, number two bidder is about 13% higher than uh, than the number one bidder, so they don't quali qualify for the local bidder preference. Um, now, uh, that that local bidder preference, though, because this is still staff recommendation coming yeah. through. So that local bidder preference, I believe, I thought applied to how the staff recommendation would come to the council. But it's my understanding that if the council desired to pick a local vendor, for example, tonight, then they could. That's just my only question that I had. But it was on my list I was considering. That, that is absolutely correct. I mean, the, the okay. policy, it's a purchasing policy. It was established and adopted by a city council at some point in time. It is direction to, count to the city staff on how we look at proposals and how we present recommendations, but the council can definitely choose to award the contract sure. to any of those vendors. Yeah, if I could clarify, I believe this is a legal question. We're bidding this project per the California Public Contract Code, and uh, the City Council passed a resolution to establish the 5% um, local bidder preference. So we've advertised the project like that. So if you wanted to do that, I think what you'd want to do is um, reject all the bids and then direct the staff some other way. But um, it's been advertised like that, and if we do, and we do check the the um, references and the qualifications. In fact, uh, the all the contractors are required with their bid to include a qualification statement. So they ha they have to provide us with the list of um, uh, projects that they've completed that are represent related experience. Uh, so the the low bidder is qualified if you do not award that you could potentially um, subject yourself to a claim or a, a lawsuit by the low bidder for not awarding them the contract when they've clearly uh, the 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 identified printed local bidder preference in the bid documents um, is not met and um, and they are uh, qualified so hmm. so you're saying we have to pick the lowest bid no it, it's more of a legal question, which yeah, I don't I, know if, uh, yeah, yeah so this is. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep us out of trouble. No, I agree, so. I agree. I just, my concern, it seems like we always have to pick the lowest bid, and, and that's not necessarily the best choice. It just seems like that's always what's presented. So well, I'm wondering per, if that's just. Per the, uh, no, that's a really good, really good question. You don't per, actually have to pick the lowest. Right, but, but it seems like every time we come in here, that's how it is. So I'm asking, is that, what's well, the deal? Well, when you, when you, my understanding, and I, the city attorney can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that by law, we are legally required for capital improvement projects that we publicly bid to award it to the lowest qualified bidder by law. And uh, oh. if, the, if, the, if the low bidder is, doesn't have the proper licenses, uh, if he has some um, state contractor's license um, action uh, uh, in process against him, 
um, if they uh, are not deemed to be qualified, if they submit on projects that they don't really, even though they have the Class A or Class B license, they have the proper license, they haven't really done that type of work. And so we can legitimately disqualify them because we can say, hey, you do not have adequate experience to do this. We're not going to be the guinea pig and let you I learn. You know, but that is my understanding. So, so um, legally, we are, we are obligated to take the lowest bid. Correct. That, that's my understanding, and that has been my understanding for many years. Okay. Uh, for that's what I was for asking. Publicly bid capital improvement projects. Yeah. Uh, unless we changed our policy around that. Is that what I'm sure, hearing? It's because this, we adopted a policy in advertising. Yeah, and the, and the uh, city of Solving is a charter city that gives us a little bit of flexibility, and within that flexibility, the city council adopted the um, local bidder preference, and all the bidders are informed of that in advance. So they, there's no surprises for them. It's all spelled out exactly as the city council established it. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. I, I got a question. The engineer's cost estimate was for $104,000. Why do you feel that the $90,000 is more than adequate to, to do this job? Uh, well, first of all, we did check the contractor's qualifications. That is a very good question, um, uh, Councilman Dearness. Uh, so when we do the estimates, we are always trying to be a little bit conservative, a little bit on the high side. Um, we really don't want um, the Public Works uh, Engineering Department to be the low bidder because, <laughs> you know, um, so we're always trying to be a little conservative in our estimates. And so what you'll see, uh, it doesn't always work out this way, but what you'll see is a spread of bids. And the, the, our goal, if, if we did a really good job at estimating, we're just like here in this range. You know, just a little bit, you know, just a little bit above the the low bidder or the the lowest couple bidders, depending on how many bidders we get. But, but that's our goal. And um, uh, so you feel pretty confident that this can be done for ninety? Yes, I do actually. Okay. It's, it's pretty it's it's pretty straightforward carpentry work. You know, remove saw cut, remove deteriorated boards, measure saw cut, install the new boards, and it's pretty straightforward work. If there's no other questions, we'll go to public comment. I have no speaker slips on this item. Is there anyone in the public that would like to speak on this item? See no one. We'll take this back to the council for discussion and action. I see there's some interest in the council to award the contract to the local contractor, but I'm hearing that that might not be an option at this point. I don't know if our city attorney would like to chime in on any of that. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I've actually never reviewed your your code for local preference. Um, it's it's a policy. It's a council adopted yeah. policy. Yeah, I, I would be very surprised if a former council could control your actions here. I would think that typically you could consider other other things on uh, what contractor to issue it to. But um, again, I also would say that. It sounds like you have a long history and representations made in particular to these bidders that you were going to use a particular process and I don't want to, to mm -hmm. run you into an extra $20,000 in legal fees over, over, over a small project yeah. over a very small project and a very small right. issue and I would also like to mention that one of the items on the advanced calendar is actually mm -hmm. looking at the purchasing policy which will incorporate review of, of know public projects as well so we can come back to you with detail and fully vetted this with the city attorney and then get your preferences on whether you want to add any other considerations other than just the lowest price into that process uh, uh, if I if I may I was just going to add um, of course I always like to use the local contractors and kind of root for them you know uh, but um, uh, we could identify a list of the types of work that local contractors are qualified to do and that we can get more than one bid. Like, for example, there's really only one um, paving contractor uh, here in San Andreas Valley. There's only one general heavy construction contractor here in San Andreas Valley. But there's a lot of um, Class B uh, licensed contractors, building contractors that could do this type of work. So on future projects, uh, we could identify that. 
where we know we can get competitive bidding from the local bidders and, um, and then uh, pursue the bidding in, a, in an alternative process, just um, going to the local. Uh, kind of like the way our purchasing policy works in a way. Right, for, for other types of things. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we can certainly do that, yeah. and, and, and you know, if that's your desire. I think you've gotten a little bit of direction for when that comes up in the future, but as for tonight, we probably should just move the staff recommendation. So I will move that. I'll second it. It's been seconded. Mayor Pro Tem Clark. I apologize, but I am, well, I don't know if I have to abstain or recuse. As a, I didn't think about this because I have done business with one of the bidders, and it makes me crazy that we can't pick somebody local, but if the rules are the rules, then I have to vote yes. Okay. What? I, oh. I don't believe you have any conflict there because you work for Nielsen's Building Materials, but. Council Member Diarnas. Yes. Council Member Johnson. Yes. Council Member Waite. Yes. Mayor Tucson. Yes. That motion carries 5 0, Mayor. Thank you. Can I add one thing? Be very careful to keep an eye on change orders on this project. It's uh, limited to 10,000. All right. Per. I item number eight. Item number eight, Mayor, members of the City Council, is the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act Intra Basin administrative agreement and once again uh, our uh, public works director will report alrighty so you may recall back in 2004 governor brown signed into law what's referred to as the S sustainable groundwater management act uh, the acronym is sgma um, a lot of times that is referred to as sigma so you might hear sigma or sgma or sustainable groundwater management act anyway that was uh signed into law in 2014. Um, so the um, San Inez River Water Conservation District um, took the lead and in March of 2016 they uh, organized and the city of Solvang entered into a um, memorandum of understanding and that was with uh, Solvang and the seven other agencies that um, have jurisdiction uh, within the San Inez River Valley groundwater basin, the whole basin basically from the uplands all the way down to Lompoc. And then in 2017, the city entered into a memorandum of agreement uh, and that was to create the Eastern Management Area Groundwater Sustainability Agency or the EMA GSA uh, and that was with Solvang and three other agencies being um, the County Santa Barbara, the San Inez River Water Conservation District, and then ID1. So those are the four agencies making up the Eastern Management Area Groundwater Sustainability Agency. Uh, so uh, SIGMA or the um, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act requires that if a basin is divided up into multiple groundwater sustainability agencies, so in our basin to the west we have the west management area, uh, which is Lompoc and the other agencies down there. We have the central management area, which is Buellton and the county of Santa Barbara, and the eastern management area, as I mentioned. So our basin was divided up into these three management areas, and when that's done, the, the the, the state law allows you to do that, but if you do that, you have to have um, an administrative agreement whereby the agencies the, in these, the, the three management areas agree to um, cooperate and an ongoing working relationship and coordination. And so um, that's required by law if you divide your basin up into these management areas. So. All three of the, the Groundwater Sustainability Agency committees have endorsed the agreement and staff recommends that the City Council approve the intra-basin administrative agreement. So that concludes my staff report. I'm happy to answer any questions. You have. Are there any questions of the staff report? Seeing none, we'll go to the public for public comment. I have no speaker slips on this item. I don't believe anyone in the audience with the limited three people we're now down to, four people, <laughs> want to speak on the item. Uh, we'll take this back to the council for discussion and action. Seems like a relatively uh, low energy item here. Maybe I'll just <laughs> move uh, staff recommendation. I'll second that. It's been seconded. 
Member Tim Clark. No. Well, Robert, would you like to speak on the item? I, I'm sorry if I moved too fast, but I didn't see much energy in anyone's Anything that comes out of Fran Pavley or Sacramento makes me nervous. And the fact that we, we, we lose um, any authority if we don't approve this just makes me ill what comes out of Sacramento. Uh -huh forcing cities and municipalities to do again and again and again, and, and, and I, I vote no. And I'd say I understand your concern, but if we all voted no here tonight and we couldn't come to some kind of agreement, it's my understanding that then they would come here and they would just decide what the solution is for the valley here, which would probably be even worse of a nightmare right, given I, your, your I, position there. I think that, um, Robert, you should come to the next meeting that we have at the end of February and, and listen, yeah. because this what this does is give us local control um, it's a good thing. I just hope you understand. I understand your concern, but I'm just saying if we I did vote no on this, then the people that Robert just expressed some discontent around would be here making our decisions for us. So <laughs> we don't want here. I don't think we want that. There's a motion on the floor. Council Member Diarnes. Yes. Council Member Johnson. Yes. Council Member Waite. Yes. Mayor Tucson. Yes. That motion carries 4 0 with Mayor Pertin voting in the no. Correction, 4-1. Okay. It's now almost 9 o'clock, and Patrick needs to change the DVD out, so I'll just we'll take a quick five-minute breather and be right back where we will now have a wastewater treatment plant.
All right, we'll resume the meeting. We're on to item number I, item number I, item number nine. Can I get a title readout and staff report? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, item number nine is the wastewater treatment plant upgrade update. Our city manager, uh, our public works director, again will report. I will kick it off really quickly with the background and then pass it on to Matt with all the details. Um, so a previous direction from the council was to uh, do several things. One was to move forward with engineering and design for the selected preferred preference for wastewater treatment plant upgrade. We also had direction to work with the community service, something as community services district to provide them with any information necessary for them to provide a proposal to the city for alternative operating uh, way uh, for the community services to provide operational support to the city. And we also had direction from the council to proceed with a wastewater rate study. Uh, following that, the council also approved a budget amendment with the first quarter financial report to additionally um, do a project to improve the aeration system. And so our Public Works Director Matt will present more detail on the status of the project for the aeration system and the wastewater treatment design. Thank you. Matt? Okay. So um, as um, our uh, city manager indicated, there's kind of four items covered. One is the um, proposal from the San Inez Community Services District to uh, uh, operate um, the city's um, sewer collection system and wastewater treatment plant. The other item is the um, uh, wastewater treatment plant engineering services contract. Uh, the third item is the um, aeration system, give an update on that. And the fourth item is the um, wastewater rate study. So I'll start off with the San Andreas Community Services District. Uh, back in August, the city council authorized um, or directed staff rather to solicit a proposal from the San Andreas Community Services District to operate our sewer collection system and wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the following week, we drafted a letter, and, and shortly after that, a letter was sent um, to the San Andreas Community Services District soliciting that uh, proposal from them. Um, we, didn't, we didn't hear anything for a while. About two months later, we received an email from them requesting a, a, a list of information about our facilities and um, I think some financial information. Uh, Within two weeks, we gathered all that information, responded back, and provided all that to them. And, um, and then we hadn't heard back from them uh, as of yet. So, so that's the status of that. Um, the second item is the, um, the engineering services proposal. So back uh, in September, the city council directed staff to, or gave staff the authorization to proceed uh, with the engineering design. So we completed our um, request for proposal and or a draft of that, and we brought that back to the city council for review, make sure uh, we weren't missing anything that you wanted included in there. And then the city council uh, approved that and we went forward. And um, what we did is we did a two-step process. So we, um, we widely distributed um, a request for qualifications and uh, we sent it out to over 13 uh, nationally, you know, recognized firms um, to solicit uh, statements of qualifications. We also posted that with some uh, uh, internet um, uh, advertising contractor and engineering services advertising. And um, anyway, so we received, I believe it was six uh, statements of qualifications. And we shortlisted three firms that we identified that were the, the most qualified. Um, we then uh, distributed the, the request for proposal to them. And uh, we received those proposals back a few weeks ago. Uh, we had a, a panel of six people review the proposals and score those, including um, uh, 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 a staff member from the San Andreas Community Services District as well as the general manager from the um, uh, Laguna Sanitation District in Orkut. Uh, he's a really um, experienced, uh, w reputable um, engineer. And, uh, and then we had interviews with the, the three, those three consultants last week, and we're finishing analyzing their um, fee proposals, and we'll have a um, staff report at the next city council meeting 
to recommend award of an engineering services contract to one of those firms. Um, and uh, the very first task that they're going to do is the final design plans and specifications for um, upgrading our aeration system. And they will work on that immediately. That is the very first thing they're going to work on. Uh, as soon as they're done with that, we're going to put that out to bid. And we'll bring that back to the city council to award that contract. And um, we anticipate uh, completion of the upgraded aeration, aeration system by um, July 31st of this year. So um, a little bit of background on that. Uh, we were um, planning to work with the San Andreas Community S Services District uh, to come up with some kind of a plan to, to upgrade, the, upgrade the whole aeration system. Um, that didn't really work out. So I directed our staff to move forward to get uh, uh, talk to contractors and vendors and get, get proposals to replace the aeration system. And through the series of uh, conversations and meetings with um, those um, vendors and contractors, they told us they, they started asking questions and we weren't, that we weren't able to answer because we needed to do calculations and have plans and specs so they could give us an accurate um, bid and uh, be able to stand behind any warranty that they have for their products. So um, at the same time as we were talking to those different vendors and contractors, we were um, put in contact with PG&E. They have a um, rebate program. Basically, uh, wastewater treatment plants and other large public facilities like that use a lot of energy. And so they're always trying to get uh, agencies to um, upgrade their equipment with the latest, most energy efficient equipment and so forth. And it just happens for wastewater treatment plants pretty much universally. Um, one of the largest costs is operating your, your aeration system. You have um, big motors and big blowers to uh, force air into these, um, this manifold and piping system. And uh, anyway, so. So PG&E uh, works with the specialty consultant, um, AESC. They're an energy system consultant. And um, uh, as part of this, um, uh, their rebate program, you, they first have to come out to the site. Then they meet with the, the, the engineering staff. And they determine whether or not you're, you know, they want to work with you or not, or, or they think there's potential for big, big energy savings. Uh, and, and for them to invest their time because they're paying for uh, engineering work now. So, so we went through that process. They've basically approved Solvang. Uh, they feel like we can make um, changes that will save a lot of energy. And um, so their specialty consultant, AESC, is right now working on the calculations and the preliminary design. And uh, they, they had told us when we met with them back in mid-November that they thought they'd be able to have that to us by the end of January. Um, they just installed, uh, on January 16th, they installed the, uh, several monitoring uh, devices on all of our equipment to monitor the power usage and all that. So I think they're a little bit behind what they thought. But hopefully, uh, by mid-February, we'll have something from them. And then we'll also have awarded the contract to our, our engineering consultant, and we'll take that those calculations and that preliminary design from AESC, hand it over to our our engineer, and they can prepare the plans and specs, uh, and we can put it out to bid uh, pretty quickly. So um, so that's where we are in all that a whole process, and um, as stated in the staff report, uh, we staff does recommend that we issue a request for a proposal. Uh, at some point um, uh, from a rate, rate consultant to do a wastewater rate study, but we recommend holding off on that until the design of the project is far enough along. We don't actually have to wait to the very end, but we want it to be far enough along where the, we have better cost estimates for the upgrade construction project at the wastewater treatment plant, and that way we can give those more accurate cost estimates to the rate consultant to do the rate study. So. So that's basically uh, what's explained in the staff report. So that concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Are there any questions of the staff report from the council? Robert. Matt, how much did the 
the the folks that physically run the plant have an in input in any of this? Uh, their their input is very very heavy. Okay, good. Uh, some engineers uh, think they're really smart and smarter than all the operators or whatever, but it's a team effort because each each half has different experience. You know, the our wastewater staff don't know the engineering and some of the calculations and some of the necessarily science behind certain parts of it, but they also have the operator experience. They are certified operators. They go through, they understand the chemistry and biology better than I do of operating a wastewater treatment plant, and, um, and they're the ones that operate it. So uh, good engineering is always, always has the operators involved heavily. And so, um, uh, you know, they, they have insights that, that engineers, a lot of engineers never operated a wastewater treatment plant. You know, they, they studied the books, they, they can pr pr prepare really cool plans and designs and stuff, but um, you got to have both parts to have a really yeah. successful project. I'm satisfied. I just think it's really, really important to get their input. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so as far as the aeration system, I mean, they were taking the lead. And I was just kind of monitoring, you know, make sure things were progressing. Uh, and as far as the overall wastewater treatment plant, uh, our, our wastewater treatment superintendent, Nathan Giacinto, and lead operator, Paul Matsukas, they were on the um, selection or review panel, selection committee to shortlist the three consultants. Okay. And they are also on the committee. And they sat in on the interviews and asked some of the questions and yeah, they've been heavily involved, heavily, heavily okay. involved. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any questions? Wait, wait. Sorry. <laughs> so what are the uh, potential um, cost savings in terms of operation and performance, and how does this affect the, our, our desire to reduce the uh, nitrogen levels? Uh, well, the aeration system is one of the uh, most critical components to um, denitrify our, uh, the wastewater. So um, it's going to help us to do that better. That will meet our, our, our obligations to the state? Correct, correct, which we are meeting that right now, but it's not in a very efficient um, manner. So upgrading the aeration system is going to help us achieve that um, denitrification with less energy and a smoother, easier process that's less um, subject to being upset because right now basically our, our aeration system does not work well at all. So how much in terms of cost savings will we realize because of this? That's a really good question. Um, when um, AESC and PG&E came out uh, before we met with them in November, they um, prepared some estimates of the, the power, uh, the, the energy cost savings, the actual dollars in savings. And um, I apologize, I don't remember the exact numbers, but we're talking in several tens of thousands of dollars per year in um, energy savings. I, w I want to say it was like thirty or forty thousand a year at least. Okay, well, is, is there any improvement in terms of labor and management? Uh, not really. I mean, right now, um, the way the the process works, um, it's mostly all programmed in through our um, SCADA system, our computerized control system, and so when you have the new aeration, aeration system, that's going to operate more efficiently. They're going to have to make adjustments to that. And it's going to be a little bit of trial and error as they as they as they kind of play around and fine tune that. But um, uh, yeah, there's actually a, the upgraded aeration system doesn't save us any um, labor at all. And what yeah. about performance in terms of the overall plant? I, my understanding is it might actually improve our gallons per day, millions per, millions of gallons per day capacity. Capacity. Uh, that is correct. That is correct. Um, there's couple different opinions, but it should <coughs> restore a little bit of the loss capacity just through the upgrade of the aeration system. And how would that affect our long-term planning in terms of replacing the uh, wastewater treatment facility as it is today? Will it buy us some time? Uh, I still think, I think we, we're still going to want to um, proceed with the rest of the upgrades. Um, 
I think what Chris is asking is it's been pretty urgent that we deal with the wastewater treatment plant situation. And I, one of the primary drivers has been the denitrification process. We've gone through right. a lot of challenges to right, get right. to where we are now. I can certainly see the difference in the power bills over the years um, right. due to that change in that process. So I think the question is by uh, installing this uh, new, new process, uh, we're making this upgrade prior to doing the actual plant upgrade, does this buy us any time in terms of, you know, can we now get five to seven years while we go through the rest of the uh, engineering and come up with the final design and go through Prop 218 and build up some reserves to pay for it? Is there any merit in any of that? Uh, I think that's what, what Chris is trying to ask. Well, it, it may only buy us a year or two. I don't know. That's why I'm asking, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, when you say buy us time, I mean, you, you have to remember we're still in the middle of the process of renewing our permit with the state. And so they've been in contact with our wastewater staff about every six months. Um, and we just were actually notified, I believe it was last week or the week, yeah, I, mean, I think it was actually last week or the week before, that they're um, developing a new general permit, uh, which, you know, we'll be bringing an update on that probably here in a few months, but, but they're working on that. And um, yeah, so I, 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 I mean, the sh I guess the short answer is no, it's not going to buy us any time because we already are m meeting the, the nitrogen limit requirement, but it's at the uh, cost of, you know, reducing the capacity of the plant. So upgrading the aeration system, I think, will restore some of that lost capacity, but not bring us, I don't believe it will bring us back up to so, the one. So before the, the consultant from PACE was like basically expressed to the council that we're like, almost that systemic failure, we have to move as fast as possible kind of thing. So does this get us out of that? Out of the red zone. Red zone. I think, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I guess from that perspective, it, you know, we don't have to rush to do everything. And this project would still be part of what we would be doing in the plant upgrade anyway. So it's not like we're just spending money that we're going to throw away. Later. Right. No. Okay. Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's important. Want to re-clarify that? Yeah, we're not going to be th we're not going to be throwing any way, away any money or you know spinning our wheels or. So if there's no more questions of the staff report, I'll take this to the public. I have one speaker slip at this point in time. That person is Karen Jones. If you'd like to come speak. Hi, I'm Karen Jones, and I'm president of the um, community service district in Santa Inez. And uh, thank you, Mayor, Council, and thank you, Matt. That was helpful. We had a meeting, I think it was in August, where we actually met at the treatment plant. And we had staff from uh, both our agency and people from the treatment plant, Matt, um, the mayor, and uh, Chris were both there. It was a great meeting, and we had a lot of optimism. And the people who work at your treatment plant and our operator, our um, level three operator, Kevin, who is a very experienced guy. He's, he's um, in his early 70s, I believe, and he's had tremendous experience and it's just a wealth of knowledge. They were maybe even more optimistic than Matt, that this was a great thing to do. It would, you know, when we talk about buying time, it's like how long will the turf last kind of discussion. But the people who work in the industry just think that this is going to be a very positive thing and it would be a necessary thing to do anyway, but it um, definitely will make the plant more efficient and keep our energy costs low. We had a meeting today with our wastewater committee uh, reviewing the final um, uh, bill for the year. We still owed you, I think it was $112,000. And I would like to thank your staff. Um, we just did the committee review. There were a couple of questions sent an email and uh, the clarification from Jason, I believe is a uh, person who responded to us back immediately. So I just want to reiterate, we have had a change in management. Our uh, general manager has resigned and it is an opportunity for us to renew our enthusiasm to be working together on solutions and um, that is my comment. Now you're giggling, <laughs> but we do feel really good about it and we feel like um, this is a really an opportunity right now to move forward and I'm excited that Matt is reporting that the um, aeration is happening because that was a little bit frustrating for us. We, everybody agrees this is a good thing and 
it's like, come on, let's do this. It's good. So I don't know if you have any questions for me, but uh, that is the message I wanted to convey. Okay, thank Great. you. Thank you. Unless anyone has any questions for Karen, no? All right, with that, I'll, I yes. Oh, yep, public. Nick. I did not fill out a speaker's uh, slip, which I should have. Nick, Nick DeCroce, uh, we watch. Uh, uh, I've spoken to you before on the subject of the wastewater treatment plant, uh, and I only have to add one thing to what I've said before. I think it's a good idea. I think we need to pursue it. I think you need to pursue it all the way to the point of eventually, someday, uh, producing recycled water out of it. That will require, if we go that far, that will require a huge multi-million dollar investment over the years. That may be the biggest legacy that your council leaves behind uh, when you retire or when you move on is the financial legacy uh, of the wastewater treatment plan. So I urge you to do it carefully, cautiously, dot all the I's and the T's that you can in analyzing each step along the way. And then on another subject that Karen just triggered, and that is I think that if there's any opportunity to put any of these agencies, these multiple agencies that we have here in the Valley, all providing um, multiple and in some cases overlapping services, if there's any opportunity to put them together, boy, I think that's a great opportunity to take advantage of. And I would encourage that as well. Thank you. I think that's definitely the direction we're moving in. I think that's the opportunity Karen was just talking about. and. As far as managing costs, you know, yes, it's a very big project. We all saw the impact it can have on everyone's rates um, here. Solvent already has very high rates. Part of why this is here and why we're trying to do this this way is to come up with that, you know, most smoothed in process with regard to the rates so that um, everyone doesn't get the complete knee jerk. Ideally, we'd have more time in terms of replacing the plant to really come up with what that plan is and how to go through Prop 218 to, you know, increase the rates to eventually build up the capital to buy it without a, you know, a sudden jump in the rates. So I think everyone's working really hard to try to figure out um, how to do that. So appreciate your comments. Um, with that, I'll take this back to the council for discussion action. If there, is there any discussion on this item? I think it's relatively straightforward. I would just point out, Matt, that now the council's passed a lot of other things that have been absorbing our time, so we'll be you know, really looking to prioritize the wastewater treatment plant. It's, again, the biggest thing we could be doing now. So not to put a little stress on your shoulders, but <laughs> we'll now be. Uh, if I could just add, no stress, don't worry. All I'm, right. I'm good for it. Because we'll, we'll uh, be like ankle biters now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's okay. I was just going to clarify, the um, engineering services proposal that we bring you at the next city council meeting includes the design for the recycled water Cool. Excellent. Oh, perfect. Good. Thank you. Great. And the cost savings? I'm sorry, what did you say, Chris? And the potential cost savings estimate? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yes. In fact, I can email that to the council tomorrow. Great. Potential so cost savings uh, estimate, is that what you're saying? Yes. yes. Okay. Power, power, cost savings. power cost savings. Power cost savings. I think it's a good thing for the community to know what uh, Matt and this council is working toward. We're trying to save money wherever we can, improve performance wherever we can, and this is a wonderful example of that. And yes, we are moving toward regionalization. Um, I, I, as Nick and uh, and um, Karen. Karen, sorry. What's her, what's her name? <laughs> I've only dated like three Karens in my life. I should know this name. <laughs> but I, I really week. appreciate the, the move, the, the, the work that this council has been doing to, um, toward this goal of regionalization. Perfect. I'll make the motion to receive and file. I second it. It's been seconded. Member Tim Clark. Yes. Councilmember the Yarnes. Yes. Councilmember Johnson. Yes. Councilmember Waite. Yes. Mayor Toussaint. Yes. Motion to receive and file carries by zero. Mayor, thank you. We're getting near that time where we need a motion to actually continue the meeting. I'll make the motion to continue the meeting. I'll second. It's been seconded. Member Tim Clark. Yes. Councilmember the Yarnes. Yes. Councilmember Johnson. Yes. Councilmember Waite. Yes. Mayor Toussaint. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries by zero. On to item number 10.
Title Read on Staff Report. Item number 10, Mayor and Council, is the grants funding policy adoption for fiscal year 2020-2022 financial plan. The city manager will report. So the item in front of you is to actually adopt or approve the grant award policy for fiscal year 2020-2022 financial plan. I've received direction from you at a previous meeting where you discussed several items such as um, limiting the awards to or prioritizing awards to senior services, having the event type of grants that used to be going through the grant policy actually be diverted through IDK process. So those two are really the 4th of July, Three Rotary and the Danish Days through Danish Foundation. This does not mean that the city would not be allocating money towards those events. It just means that it would not go through the grant policy process. And then the last direction was to begin negotiations with the Everhoi Museum to develop a mutually beneficial contract with them and also not have them go through the grant process. I have already m had a meeting with Esther from Everhoi Museum. I believe she was going to speak that same day with her board of directors. So we are moving forward on that aspect. And so what's in front of you here on page 143 is a policy that in some ways looks uh, similar to previous years, in some ways is different. I named it human services grant funding because it really focuses on only those types of services and it allows for prioritization openly in this policy towards senior services and um, also requires all grantees to enter into a standard contract, which is the next attachment here which was developed through the last financial during the last financial plan that requires that the funds cannot be used for administrative costs as well as any political or religious purposes and also creates a reporting structure for the organization or the grantees to come back at the end of fiscal year and report to council so this policy would create a more straightforward, uh, transparent process to where um, we are stating clearly to organizations that you know the, the events will be going through a different direction, and this grant award policy is really for human services with an emphasis on senior services only. You could add to that policy any kind of cup of the dollars if you would like to, or you could adopt it as presented. Before you continue, you made a comment that was one of your last statements that the city has the right to audit or look at performance at the end of the year, right? They have to come back and subject themselves to if we should so choose an audit. Why isn't that written here in the policy? Well, it's actually included in this states that they would have to execute the contract with the city. And so the contract itself, which is the next uh, attachment, has all of those conditions, including reporting structure, and that's actually a requirement for them to submit specific reports at the end of the fiscal year. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions of the staff report? Um, I have one question. In your conversations with Elver Hoy, um, do they seem receptive to this? In my conversation with Esther before she spoke with her board of directors, she was receptive and so I basically asked her to present to the city a scope of work that they think that they would like to propose through this process uh, and that's what she was going to talk to, to their board of directors. Okay. I have not heard Great. back yet. Thank you. And I've spoken with Esther as well and um, I think the initial just, you know, fear is just of any, you know, change but I, th I I think after really talking with her, she sees the, the positive light to, uh, to it. It actually that. makes her job even easier, yeah. I think, in terms I of I mean, she could have a multi-year, you know, there's several things That's that exactly happen. That's right. exactly right. So, right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, with that, we'll go to public comment. I have no speaker slits on this, on this item. Would anyone like to speak on this item? Seeing none, we'll take this back to the council for discussion and action. Who would like to start? Um, I will. Karen. So um, I know that we were making an emphasis on senior citizen services, but I also know that it was important uh, that we focused on human services. And um, I am thinking that we should include um, services in there such as the Boys and Girls Club because that is service not just for seniors. It's not for seniors but it is human services for families in need for uh, 
for care for their children in before and after school programs. Um, nope. And we do actually have that organization active here in Solvang. Um, and I know we wanted to focus on uh, needs right in Solvang. So I don't know if we wanted to expand that. That, it, was, that was a thought. And I can understand it. My, um, p my personal position on it would be to, I think this is actually very well laid out considering the council direction at the last meeting. So I think that uh, staff did a great job at putting uh, this policy together. I would suggest that you know they first try running through the conduit that we're establishing through IDK and let's just give th some things some time because the same argument could be made around all of the great organizations that provide services here within the city and then we're right back into the thing of the ever-expanding never-ending bucket um, but that's just my personal opinion there and I, I agree with that completely has staff done any kind of analysis in terms of what the needs are related to what she's referring to for example um, it may even include things like uh, the food, uh, what do you call it, the food aid? So, yeah, Veggie Rescue. There's a number of programs like that that help our senior citizens both here in Solving as well as in Buellton. I was talking to the group out there and um, I don't know if that, I'd like to know what the potential uh, benefit would be from our standpoint to supporting those kinds of organizations. I know the Chumash do a, a great deal of uh, work with them and, and uh, repurposing some of their their things from their restaurants. Perhaps we can come up with a program like that that we could support, you know, the local restaurants that could then help with those kinds of things too. We have not done any analysis. Um, generally speaking, this grant award process is completely discretionary to the council. The responsibility of human services is really laying with the county and then the state. So at city level, this is completely discretionary as to what services you would like to support. The way this policy is written, it doesn't limit applications to senior services that alone, but it puts an emphasis that the uh, council is likely okay. to. That actually, thank you for and clearing that up. And, I, and again, I'd like to point out that any or any one of these organizations, for example, when we had Fall Fest, you know, there was things that benefit benefited Sam during that. It's not to say that well, during any one of these activities that yeah. one of these organizations could. Well, I think she cleared the my, her, my the question I had up Every perfectly. Event. Yeah, I think that that that, that does understand. That, that explains it and gives some leadway into um, donations to other um, other deserving groups, yeah. right? It, it, it's not going to be perfect, but I think you, you got to let it ride a little bit and then come back and reassess. Change what? You may want to change the word at the beginning of policy direction number one to be focus the grant awards pro process rather than limit. I would agree with that, yeah. Mm, I like well, limit. no, I, th I like limit. The reason why is the second you say focus, it's still going to generate a binder about this thing. Right. Yeah. I, well, think I, you, think I think you're going right back to opening up to all the nonprofits the, are going to stick to the I, I would just like to point out that I think the general direction last time was to limit it, a majority of you, to senior services. I would like to also point out that the way the policy is laid out right now, the way it's written, is that it only focuses on the seniors versus limiting it to that. So that is for you to make a decision on today as to whether you would approve it as it's laid out, to just focusing on senior services but not limiting to, or you truly want to limit it to senior services. I got a question. If we don't um, put a cap on it, what, is, what does that entail? Um, are we not are you going to give away? Is it give well, staff the ability to give you, away? You whatever? still the uh, cap is still a figurative item because you could say today that and here you want this policy set at one hundred thousand dollars for the year, for example. You could still then go through this process and the the council makes the final determinations of the grants it's given away. Well, that's what I'm saying. And a council so, member could make the motion. Right. So when it comes <laughs> to, back, is it are you going to come back with amounts or what's the, or is it just going to take the applications? It or? would be the same way, similar to the same way as it was before. So we'll post an online application. We'll have a deadline, and then those applications will come to council for consideration. Oh, so the the two things that are 
now not part of this process is you don't have the SCVB, you don't have the chamber, so the tourism is not within this, the special events through, you know, the Rotary and the Danish Days is not pr part of this process anymore. So you're really just by this policy and calling it the human services policy and then focusing it on senior policy as your preference, you will likely limit the number of applicants now right. that are coming to you for funding. Great. Right. I, well, I like that choice of words. Fantastic. I would yeah. go with that, but I don't know. Are you well, telling I th me? I think that that's what is here. Exactly. That's okay. what's here. All right. I will, move, I will move staff recommendation. I'll second it. It's been seconded. Member Tim Clark? Yes. Councilmember Diarnes? Yes. Councilmember Johnson? Yes. Councilmember Waite? Yes. Mayor Toussaint? Yes. That motion carries 5 0, Mayor. Thank On you. On to item number 11. Could I get a title readout and staff report? Item number 11, Mayor and Council, is the formation of the Economic Development Staff Committee, as uh, stated, an item from uh, last meeting. Thank you. So there is no written report on this item. This was part of the discussion at the special meeting on Wednesday the 22nd when you heard a report from Cosman Companies and approved their extension of the contract. The extension of their contract includes working on a specific site at the Veterans Hall, uh, looking at the uses for that, as well as potential rezone of the TRC. It also includes work for more general um, economic development that looks at land use and informs your future general plan development adjustments and further adjustment to the TRC zone. So one of the items that was brought up during that time by Council Member Dejernius was to potentially form an economic subcommittee to work with Cosmont and staff and this item is here in front of you as to whether you would like to do that or not or give alternative direction. Are there any questions of the staff report? Seeing none, we'll go to the public. Public comment. I have no speaker slips on this item. Would anyone like to speak on this item? No one would like to speak on this item. I'll take it back to the council for discussion and action. Chris, you asked for this item. I'll let you start. Yeah, my background is in economics. I have a master's in economics, a, a BA in economics. I love economics. <laughs> but more importantly, um, I think that there were some things that I would like to have seen addressed in the last Cosmont report. Um, and I think that an economic development com ad hoc committee or just an economic committee would, would have been able to perhaps uh, made, you know, get, got those things into that report. Um, I think that, for example, Cosmont has done work with Buellton on visioning for their city. I think that's kind of the direction I'm thinking of with respect to this committee, is that we need to really clarify what Solvang's vision is going forward, which I think should include a master plan. And we've talked about the idea, for example, of districts within that master plan. Well, that's a great idea, but then how do we prioritize the development of those districts? Let's say there's five districts that we decide on, we agree to, which one gets priority, right? So that, again, that might be an area where the Economic Development Committee would work together with Cosmon and the Council, or maybe coming up with unique public-private partnership ideas and financing alternatives. There's a lot of things that, that rather than expect Cosmont to do on their own, maybe the, the committee can work together with Cosmont to get some of those answers. Uh, at the end of the day, I think the committee um, is a good thing, both in terms of um, helping to define the vision and also helping the community understand the direction of the council. Those are my two cents anyway. I agree. I think it's, I think it, it's, there's no negative to it. I think it gives the ability of uh, individuals that want to work and involve themselves more in it to, to be involved. And that's part of the reason why we're on the council. And it's part of the reason why you were voted on the council is for your ideas and your visions. And people want you to be involved and in, in working on these things. So what I- What about your vision? Who's the point? I'll share that with you. <laughs> um, so are you guys looking at creating a more uh, permanent standing no. committee? No. Or no. is this an ad hoc committee? I actually committee? think this should be an ad hoc committee that really runs through the end of the budget process. I think some of the things that we come up with, if they're adopted by the council, that would then be um, implemented through the budget process. Yeah, I think it's definitely for a uh, duration of time. It's not just ongoing. There's a purpose. And what members sure. of the community would be looking at working with on strategies to implement? Ben Tolson. No. 
I, I don't really have any ideas of, as to who at this point in time. I do. Thank you. I mean, I, I know people that, that could add, um, provide a lot of insight given their expertise in real estate development or economic development. I love Ben Olson and the, a lot of his ideas in terms of informing you know, where we've come and, and where he'd like to see us go. But that's more of a... Mr. I, Mayor, members of the council, I would urge if you're going to create this as an ad hoc committee that you leave it to the two members of the ad hoc committee on who they're going to talk to, what who they're else gonna they're going to talk to in the community. If you're going to turn this into picking particular people from the community, this is not going to. I agree. Yeah. Understood. Mm -hmm. Understood. Okay. Okay. So this is a temporary committee to work with um, different elements of the community on um, economic development or visioning type items to come yeah, up. Yeah, I think developing strategies. The budgeting cycle. I think it would basically would be helping to develop strategies to realize the council's vision. And then those strategies would be, assuming they're voted on and approved, would go into the budget process. Okay. Mr. Mayor, do you, I'm guessing that council member Yearness is volunteering for this. Do you have a second member? of the council who's volunteering, if you have such a committee? Who, you mean who would like to babysit Chris? <laughs> or uh, translate. Or translate. <laughs> um, okay, so is there, uh, is there, let's start by first, is there consensus on the council to create uh, this ad hoc subcommittee? Sounds like Daniel, yes. I have no problem with it, yeah, I think it's. Um, Chris. It's not a bad obviously idea. Obviously, yes. Yes. I can go along with it. I can go along with it's, it. Uh, if it's under the scope of kind of what we're defining now. Um, my only concern is the getting too closely involved with Cosmont because they were brought in to do, um, you know, specific uh, work regarding um, the, the items we've already approved with their, with their contract. Um, but uh, we wouldn't want to limit because ultimately if you went out and brought in a different consultant around more of a visioning type scope or things like that that could be run during the budget process, then we'd want to stay agnostic there. I think that'd be the best practice. Um, but that's my that's my only feedback. I'm happy to yeah um, otherwise to the two individuals to to go out and develop some of these things and you know share that vision or come up with their ideas and bring them back and okay it'll come back. Who's the second person? I'd like to volunteer you, Mayor. <laughs> Since you like babysitting me, let's go. Create more work for me. Okay. <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> Sounds like that's a motion. I don't know why what you have against me, but that's fine. I'll go along. Oh, I didn't even, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just assumed you liked him babysitting me more than you did. So. <laughs> Somebody has to. <laughs> May, on that I motion, just, may I Karen, did you have any other I feedback? Just had I just had sure. my comment is very uh, – is. Ryan's also. Uh, my concern is the micromanagement of uh, Cosmont. I don't want that to happen. It should be an informational exchange. I can promise you that it will not happen. I, and I have one more question. Our meeting with Cosma d does not cost the city any more money, or are they billing us by the hour? No, it's a no. flat fee. Okay, thank you. That's all I need to know. We have a motion and a second, Mayor. Council Mem uh, Member Tim Clark? Yes. Council Member Diarnes? Yes. Council Member Johnson? Yes. Uh, Council Member Waite? Yes. Mayor Toussaint? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Mayor. On to item number 12, AB 1234 report outs, Council comments and requests. I'd like to start off with AB 1234. I'm not aware of any um, items that anyone's attended. I don't think there has been anything that the city pays for, so I don't think we have any. Can staff think of any? I think we're... I can't think of anything since the last report. Okay. Uh, so that settles that. And then we have council comments and request. Who would like to start? I only have one. Um, I Since um, Matt did such a wonderful job on those speed bumps, I have been getting bombarded with requests to possibly upgrade our other speed bumps uh, next to the school. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> 
Um, I would just speed, bring that speed up. Humps, yes. Speed humps. Yes. Not speed bumps. Speed humps, sorry. Um, but I don't know if you've driven over them, but the ones over, the ones, the new ones they put in are um, obviously much, much better than the ones um, around the school on Laurel. And uh, so I've been, you know, people have approached me quite a bit about that. So I was just going to bring that up and see if we could um, direct, if, if you guys are in agreement to direct staff to bring back possibly upgrading those, uh, especially around the schools. Uh, Absolutely. That's, that's I, I can agree with that. I don't know if anyone else. How, is how are the sp are we doing speed humps over there on on Vi Viborg or is it just speed calming oh. techniques? That was speed calming. And do we have any? Ha have we had a an officer stationed there to um, provide potential ticketing? We had for a while. I have not checked as of lately, as of the latest activity on that. So, but that was the. And I don't want to get. I don't want us to get too much into discussion over some of these items and and speed. Humps is a relatively small item in itself, yes. um, but a popular thing that we've been dealing with around here is traffic calming. So maybe we just re um, bring that up on the agenda to and see where we're at with regards to newly implemented traffic calming um, strategies that have already been done and other potential areas within the city that we could implement some of that and maybe give some direction to staff around um, the preferred speed humps style. Yeah, I just think specifically around the schools, that's when people have been yeah. asking me about. So. so I think that could all be under, done underneath an agenda item like that. If, mm -hmm. if the council would like Chip, to. Chip, would that be appropriate? That would be appropriate. Okay. Robert? The only, my only comment is I'm, I love this agenda we had tonight. It's really fun coming here and, and discussing things to make solving better with no fireworks, just nuts and bolts. And that's what I like. So that's my comment. Great. I, th I think we'll have more of those as we get more of the tourism stuff off of our uh, plate here. Karen? I have no comments for this evening. Chris? No coyotes. No coyotes. <laughs> okay. All right. Since you brought that up, um, well, I mean, uh, because um, my HOA meeting, we did, we did meet, and I did discuss... Um, contact with fish and game because we do have a problem in this particular HOA I do not know about other neighborhoods in Solvang but um, a member or two I'm not sure um, has mailed or emailed the City Council regarding my stance on the uh, coyote population <laughs> control um, but I just wanted to let you all know that we never actually formed a committee and we have put it to rest at this point um, so I, we're not, our HOA at this point is not taking any action on this um, unless we have, you know, uh, input from many residents in the city of Solvang that it is a problem all over Solvang. That's when I would suggest having the city involved. All right. Chris? I just wanted to say thank you to our staff. I think you guys are doing a great job and have come, a, we've come a long way because of you guys. And I know that we have a lot more on our plate. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing that, those future agendas. Thank you again. I'll just resound that. And at some point, we probably need to talk about uh, city manager next steps. So, but I'll let, let that kind of be at our acting city manager and the attorney to bring that to us. But it probably needs to be dealt with at some point. Um, and then uh, we also had uh, on the last agenda, an item that was, oh, I know it was during the, the uh, CAFR report. It was really showing a lot of emphasis on the impacts of retirement plans on our um, budgeting cycle. And it reminded me that we actually had now twice issued out an RFP. And I think a third time we wanted to issue out yeah, an RFP because the prior two we weren't too happy with um, around uh, the whole CalPERS type item. So I might request that we sharpen the pencil on that and uh, you did, and um, yes, the last direction was to reissue the RFP again. I was hoping to fold that discussion into the next financial plan and the financial policies and financial forecasts because it really naturally folds into that discussion as we develop the next financial plan and the financial strategy, which Perfect. is that is a big part of. So hopefully, we'll get that really that RFP released. Yes, uh, so we are made in China. I would need to release the RFP within the next week or two for us to fold it into the financial p plan process and to have it open for a long period.
period of time sufficient to get the per so put the priority on that perha perhaps we can even bring people down from uh, Sacramento our representative on CalPERS Robert's not, <laughs> <laughs> Robert's not gonna like <laughs> welcome to solving unless you're from Sacramento yeah <laughs> um, so anyway I think you have your direction otherwise thank you for all your hard work and doing a great job so thank you thank you with that we're adjourned and these cookies really are made in China I didn't believe that <laughs>